Good evening, everyone. We're gonna, gonna call this meeting to order. And if Ms. Goodell will call the roll, please. Uh, Mr. Anderson? Here. Ms. Gill? Here. Ms. Litton? Here. Mr. Reitinger? Here. Ms. Russell? Here. And Mr. Webb? Here. Thank you. And if you would rise and join with me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. all right. And before we do the moment of silence, I just want to, uh, to say that we just wanted everyone to keep Ms. Michaels and her family in our thoughts as um, she has some things going on with her, with her husband and just want to make sure that we think about her tonight and um, know that she's she's missed, but we she's at the place that she needs to be right now, taking care of family. So, uh, and if we would observe a moment of silence in recognition of 9/11. Thank you very much. That's where I just want to move the agenda. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. All, right. all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Uh, next will be the spotlight for for this month, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everybody, uh, and happy Tuesday. Um, nice to see you all tonight. Um, our spotlight on learning is our high C program, uh, and uh, before we uh, introduce the folks that are here from George Mason. Um, we'll go ahead and do the do the video first, and then we'll ask you to come up and join us in case there are qu questions. Roll tape. <laughs> George Mason High School. I'd like to talk a little bit about our hybrid learning program here at George Mason. It started as a way to address the diversity of learning needs for our students. In the very beginning, we had a curriculum that was basically facilitated and managed by our teachers, but over time, it's evolved to be quite different. We really try to help kids on every level of the spectrum, from just competency-based, who are just trying to meet their credits, and to kids who are trying to, uh, for enrichment purposes. Our hybrid learning program is a combination of instruction being delivered through online modules in a partnership with the teacher giving direct instruction to students. There's actually an instructor that is creating all of these courses from Mason for the students. That instructor knows the student, is available in the high c room. Many of our students have a block in their schedule devoted to high c so they are in the room with us and we are monitoring their progress and answering questions as needed. Some courses may be one or two units because that's all the student needs for credit recovery and other courses may be the entire semester because the student wants to get ahead. We, we mimic the units that are taught in a regular traditional course, but even though the units are very similar, the pacing is different, um, some of the assignments might be modified based on student interest or student need, and they use a platform called Schoology to create courses for the students. So by using a variety of resources that they create, or that they find online, they can truly put together a personalized course which means that we may use things like study.com, all of our library databases, um, interactive simulations with things like Explore Learning Gizmos, um, or even resources that we've created ourselves. We have a lot of IB diploma kids who need to meet different standards. Um, for PE, I have a lot of homebound students and the other courses too, um, but a lot of students who, are, who can't do PE in the regular classroom will take PE. A lot of transfer students who, for whatever, like a student transfers in their senior year, they miss the government course, they can take, they take the government course with us. The teacher is the one creating the course, so we are aware of exactly where they are in the course and how they're doing. If any problems arise, we can modify the course for them, and they have access to a teacher for questions at any time. So it's not just an online experience, it's truly a hybrid experience because the teacher is there helping the whole way through and communicating either in person or through email or other means. And students have just a greater chance sometimes to, to learn the material before having to move on to something new. So tonight,
right, we have uh, Cindy Thrush, who's with us, and Mr. Hills from the high school. So if you want to come up, in case there are some questions, um, our, our hybrid learning program is something that um, we are very proud of at George Mason, and we have a number of students that take it, as was indicated, for credit recovery, but we have an awful lot of students that also take it to accelerate. Um, and it's a perfect complement and solution to our international baccalaureate program, which sometimes uh, creates fewer opportunities for students to get in some of those things they have to get in, such as economics and personal finance, or a, uh, as you saw, a PE credit or some others. And uh, so it's a nice solution for some of those students as well. But welcome, um, Ms. Thrush and Mr. Hills. And um, Mr. Chair, if you have any questions, certainly we'd be happy to take those. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for all the work you all do within the program. Are there any questions from any uh, board members? <laughs> I'm kind of curious about what percentage of sorry what percentage of students take a high C course in high school. Yeah, that's a great question, and it really fluctuates depending on the time of the year. Uh, as noted, I think Ms. Seabridge uh, gave the numbers. I think at the last school board meeting about the number of students enrolled in our summer academy program, uh, we were close to about 300 students. And if you take away the seniors, you're talking about more than 50 percent of our students enrolled in our program, and that is. Part of our high C program as well. Uh, throughout the year, it does fluctuate. It depends on the time, whether it's going to be quarter one, quarter two, depending on uh, some students that may transfer in, as uh, Mr. Duche alluded to a little bit. Uh, also, this year, we have about 150 students enrolled in personal finance and econ. I'm so glad Dr. Noonan brought that up. Uh, what that's done for us is it's actually allowed some of our numbers in our visual and performing arts elective courses to grow a little bit. Uh, so if you do the math, you're probably looking at, by the end of the year, um, over 50% of our student body enrolled in at least one high C course. Ms. Layton? Um, if you would make sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I know I've heard a lot about yeah, econ and I've experienced credit recovery. <laughs> <laughs> but <Yourself>? um, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> through through my children. Um, but are do you feel like there's some things you, you guys are able to offer that aren't regular offerings Absolutely. through that? And is that an area where you know, looking to grow at all in the future? Or? Well, we offer similar courses to what is offered in the traditional classroom. So by offering other courses do you mean actual different courses or a different course experience about what we already offer I, I think I meant more like does it does it allow us to offer a greater variety of courses at all I don't, I don't know that it does right now but I, th I think it, it, it does to an extent when you talk about the actual individualization of, of the program right so we talked about how we may have let's say an English 9 course mm -hmm. Uh, where a student is not being successful in the traditional learning environment. So for us, and what Ms. Thrush will do, is she'll work with the student or students to really make sure that, that it meets the needs of the learner. Um, and that in itself becomes a very differentiated course uh, that sometimes is, is what, what you're speaking to. In terms of maybe elective courses and things like that, we've explored with that option as well. Um, prime example of that is an astronomy course that, that we offer. Uh, so we recognized that there was a clear need for an additional science elective. And about three years ago, we started building our course from scratch. Uh, we went to some of the local high schools, Falls Church High School. They have an astronomy program there. It's been going strong for about 15 years. And uh, we actually went to some. We went to University of Maryland, and we took all of the content and, and kind of made it what we think would meet the needs of our students, uh, but also satisfy the requirements of the state. So, uh, yeah, we're definitely exploring, um, and that's something we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but as for courses... We have, in our Schoology course menu, we have, you know, 20, 30 courses each because, you know, there might be a standard English 10, but then when a student comes in, based on where he was from the classroom and what his strengths and weaknesses are, we take the standard 10 and then we modify it for the child. So we have, it's almost like, especially in social studies or English or math, those courses that each child is really his own course because we're, we're changing it and, and building it for that, that child. Sorry, can I ask another question? Mm -hmm. And all of the courses are ones we've essentially built ourselves. We don't take any of the like course 
Sarah, or some of those external courses and offer them through our program, is that correct? They're all kind of homegrown courses? They, they are, so for years, and um, Stosh was with us at, at the beginning, as she mentioned, you know, we used a program called Compass Learning. And so it was a combination of kind of hyperlinks from there, also using some of our, uh, the curriculum from Schoology, as well as the traditional classrooms, and it was kind of a mixed mesh of, of all of those uh, items and then what we decided to do after compass no longer uh, existed we said you know do we feel like we have the teachers in place the content in place in order to really kind of build our own courses and what does that look like and we felt like since we were doing it for our students anyway it made most sense uh, and that's that's been the model that that, that we use and it, it seemed to, to to work right now um, you know at times it's a challenge when you have an influx of students let's say at the end of semester one so all of a sudden we have 90 students that are now taking a course what is that look like and so it does require a lot on the front end from our teachers which is why they're not just teachers they're curriculum specialists they're building course content based on what the state has told us to do but also based on what the student needs so um, it's really kind of a, a specialty role in terms of that uh, but it's something we're very excited about Thanks. other questions oh. Ms. Castillo. thank you mr. chair uh, be interested to know how has high C evolved over the past few years one feature I've heard for example is that it used to be you could let a course run and now you're prompted from time to time to make sure you're there paying attention and participating yes. and and what are some of the other like what what is the, the evolution of this medium been well I mean it's true that four or five years ago it was done through compass so the kids could sign up whenever they wanted and it, it did run it continued to run until they finished so whenever they finished was when they finished and that could be over a year later um, that's no longer the case now that teachers build the courses themselves we have more ways through Schoology to actually contact kids and update kids so just like the regular course teacher puts updates in Schoology and, and the kids sees I have homework we do too so once every week you know we'll update are you on week two yet and all of our courses are designed in weeks so the course is a semester and there's 18 folders for the 18 weeks so it's pretty clear for students oh this is week four am i in week four because if i'm not then i might be behind um, so we update them through schoology we update them on power school at interim and finals as far as the comments you know just comments at the quarter in the interim time are you behind um, we really push to, to actually contact parents more and just do a better job of letting people know if their child's not making progress. Um, but the tools of Schoology allow us to do that. And we do have end dates now. Um, if a child starts a course during the school year um, and if they don't finish by June 14th, they go into Summer Academy automatically. They have to finish in summer and they have that summer and then whenever Summer Academy ends, they have to be done. So we don't let you go anymore from summer to fall. Fall starts a new, a new year. And that has to be done because now that teachers create the courses, the courses archive each year, and we also update them each year, so we can't have a student in it for two years because we already have a new, a new crop of courses. So there is still an element um, to the course that's asynchronous, right? So you may have a student who at the end of the first semester is not doing well in the traditional classroom, we move them into high C. But then because of this kind of three semester almost college model in a way, uh, we're able to really pinpoint what that issue is um, and they still have ultimately an entire school year to finish, which is nice. Mm -hmm. If I could just follow up with one other question. Ms. Litton kind of touched on something. High C, there's a, there's a wide array of, I mean, there's the in-person in courses. There's dual enrollment. There's high C. Is high C anything online? I've, I've heard some discussion of other IB courses, for example, that you could take online. And I don't know whether that's a, a possibility or a real, a yeah, real there's issue that's happening. And, and so it, it seems that you've got a, a expanding matrix of, of ways of doing things. And how does it all fit together? I think that's a great description. Uh, there, there's a lot that falls under that umbrella. In terms of IB, they use a program called Pomosia. Uh, and so we, we really do try to meet the needs of the students who are taking those courses and uh, we only have maybe a few students that might be in that particular 
uh, boat where they have to ultimately take a Pomoja course. It's not something that's run really through high C. Uh, I know you mentioned Coursera. There's some BYU online courses that students do. We have a uh, dual enrollment that's separate. So that's what you're referring to as the Extended Learning Institute. We have a couple students that may be enrolled in one of those, those courses. And um, in the past, our high C instructors have really served as a liaison between uh, the facilitator of whatever program we're using, whether it's BYU or even dual enrollment. Um, but traditionally, them being the main instructor, that doesn't happen in that in that scenario. And, and our, I'm sorry, Ms. Hurst, you were going to say? No. Uh, is Middlebury still ongoing, the language courses? It, it is not. So we, we ended our partnership with Middlebury um, about two years ago. Uh, we saw that we can meet the needs of our students with the courses that we offer. Um, and we found that kind of working with uh, a third party, was, it was challenging in terms of trying to align their timelines to our timelines. Their semesters ran very differently, more on a college schedule. Uh, and so I know Ms. Thrush can attest to the challenges that, that, that we had, and so we decided it would be best. Now, if a student uh, comes to us and does ask if they want to take that particular course, um, we will honor it in terms of their, their completion uh, and on their transcript. Uh, but we do not facilitate the program itself anymore. Well, it sounds like a lot of work, and I, I commend you, especially Ms. Thrush, for <laughs> tailoring so many courses to so many students. It's, it's a lot to juggle, I'm sure, so thank you. Uh, a couple more, sorry. Please. Uh, one, <clears throat> since you've gone to the, the new system where you put all the courses together, have you done any measures of effectiveness of high C's compared to classroom learning? You know, I know it's very difficult to compare because your student bodies may be different and you would need to control for that. But I'm curious as to if there are, are there results about the outcome on things like SOL tests or otherwise in terms of performance of the students. So this is actually the first year that we are implementing um, the program all through Schoology where we're not using Compass or any kind of hyperlink. So, I mean, I think that's a, that's a great question. And I think the data we're going to have to come up with in, at the end of the year to make that determination. Um, but um, it, yeah, it's, it's a good one. It's a good question. I mean, I, I teach English, so my courses aren't necessarily SOL courses because that's just 11th grade. But I mean, I know the other teachers, and from what I've heard from them, what I know about their SOL results, almost everybody does pass. So I think on par with they're learning the content, they're passing the SOLs, um, they're, they're getting what they need as far as the standards are concerned. I think the alignment piece is critical, though, uh, when we talk about our MYP units um, and exactly what we're doing with DP. Don't think of the high C courses as it being separate. Miss um, Thrush is part of the collaborative team, so she'll sit, sit with the English 9, 10, and 11 teams and talk about what she's doing to build her courses and uh, similarly what they're doing uh, inside the classroom. So there's really not this disconnect that exists. I think in years past it, it may have, but uh, that's been a point of emphasis for us over the last couple of years for sure. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I add on to that just for a second? Um, in a previous district that I was in, we did do a study to determine how kids did uh, in the online courses versus the standalone courses. And what we actually found was that kids in the online courses typically did better. Uh, and the reason that they did better was there was when we interviewed them and went a little deeper was because they tended to be more motivated. Um, they had signed up for the online course and because they had signed up and sort of were affirmatively taking it, um, they, they had more buy-in, if you will, into the course. So I would anticipate we'll see some of that, some of that this year. The last question I had is you talked about some of the third parties you've worked with before. It sounds like we're putting in a lot of work to make sure that our online or high C courses, excuse me, align with the things that we're doing in the real classroom. Has there been any thought or is it sort of too much of a burden to consider of actually sharing what we do with other schools so they could take the content that we generate and duplicate high C with a little bit less effort? It's, it's possible. I mean, it, the ninth and 10th grade classes are set up MYP style. So they're, they're very, and they're, that's why they're aligned with the cu curriculum teams of those different contents. So unless you are an MYP school, those courses almost wouldn't be all that useful to you because they're graded in a way that you wouldn't even understand. Um, but it's it's possible. I know we have people who come in the summer. Yeah, and, that, and that's what I was going to touch on. Yeah. When you think about, um, we have out of district students 
that want to take our, our summer academy courses. Uh, and so what, what we've noticed is in the time frame of, let's say, an 11-week program, are they able to get through the entire year? And, and, you know, we've seen it. I think the system we put in place really pay dividends for some of the students that can't take traditional courses at their home-based schools. Um, the numbers are very low, so I don't have the data that, that can really show you exactly uh, if that's something we can use in the future. Uh, when we've worked with Falls Church High School, for example, in an astronomy program, it's something that, that you know, we, we spoke about. But uh, I think, you know, right now, our teachers are spending a lot of time individualizing the courses and you know because they are so individualized does it make sense to let's say have it work in i don't know a marshall or um you know a loudon county school I, I think it's a great question to ask and it's something i'd love to explore um, the 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 impetus was really around i was thinking about ib schools that might have mm -hmm. similar challenges to us and so that would oh, hopefully yeah. get around some of the things like myp grading but it, one of the wonderful things about doing things online is you can do once and you can leverage it a lot mm -hmm. more. So while it would be very hard to do this with offline in classroom courses, the fact that you're delivering it through Schoology and while you want a classroom instructor there, it's easier to package up and share. It is. Um, and so it just might be a very interesting way to work to collaborate with other IB schools to see if you could share data and they have courses that you could use and you could give them courses that we have. So Absolutely. Um, thank you for that. I have a question just building on that sort of idea. I don't know if you've ever had anybody ask, like, for example, if you're a state department family and you're going somewhere for a year, yes. um, could they still take high C overseas? Absolutely. And, we have several oh, yeah. graduates from last year and someone who came about two years ago to speak to the board and talk about that, that very uh, scenario where uh, I think they left. Uh, they went to France for two years and they didn't offer the same level math or English and so they were able to take it overseas um, and then they were able to join their peer group 11th grade and graduate on time so it, it, it has happened before absolutely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that and that's I think what's so great when you're talking about you know, all the State Department Foreign Service um, transient nature of our building where you have 80 to 120 students a year that are coming in a lot of them come in their junior year and it's like oh my goodness we have all these Virginia State requirements well guess what you can still take your full IB load but we can also provide you with those additional requirements that you need to take and maybe it's the competency route so they're not up till midnight finishing these courses and, and I think that's an amazing opportunity for many of our kids um, So it, it, it really depends. It's, it's based on the student. Um, what we'll do is, and it depends on the circumstance, right? We'll sit down with the counselor if there's an extenuating circumstance where, I think Mr. Duche talked a little bit about uh, some of our homebound kids uh, or some kids that may be dealing with, you know, some emotional issues, um, students on, on an, uh, an IEP, you name it. There, there are a myriad of reasons as to why we might consider something like that. We, we have had students who take, um, you know, very high load when it comes to the number of IC courses and they've been quite successful so it, it's hard to answer that because it depends if we have your traditional student come to us and say you know I don't want to step foot in high school well we, we'd like to kind of work with them to see why that is because I think a part of what we want at the high school is that experience right um, them being a part of, the, of, of what we do every single day outside the world of academia so it's a good question Mr. Castillo Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one question just came to mind, sort of looking at that picture there in the, the classroom space. How does high, feet, high C fit into the new high school? What, what are your thoughts about what that looks like? That's, that's a wonderful question. We've been meeting over the last few months to, to discuss that. Um, and, and it's interesting. I mean, you talk about this program where students have to actually go to a room, but then on the other side, you think about, well, high C, can it be done anywhere in the building? You think about the open spaces for learning flexible learning environments that uh, if, we, if, if you take a look at what the new building has laid out for us, I mean, it's conducive to what we're trying to do. And so I think, you know, to answer your question, it, it, it happens everywhere. Um, but I think there is... That's a great question. That's... <laughs> she, I think she asked me that like last week, to be honest with you. Um, no, it's, it's, it's a valid question, but I also, when you think about 
her responsibility and the high C, high C teacher's responsibility. You know, there's that management piece, facilitation, um, the, the curriculum specialist, but also the teachers. So, you know, can that be done, let's say, in a classroom environment? Absolutely. Does it have to be done the way it's done right now? Absolutely not. Uh, so I think that's something we're having conversations about. It's not just what's happening in two years, three years, but also in 30 years. What is this program going to look like? Is it going to be part of what we do as an entire school? Um, and if you take a look at the numbers, we've gr grown tremendously. It's hard to, to say that you know this number of students are take a high C program. So we have a lot of students that are enrolled in, in, um, in receiving their education in an online format uh, or just a differentiated format. So that's a roundabout way of saying that the possibilities are endless, um, but I think we have a good direction in where we want to go. Any other questions? All right. Thank you both very much for coming Thank out. You. Thank you, everyone. All right, next we are going to <clears throat> do some VSBA School Board Academy recognition. Uh, VSBA is a Virginia School Board Associations is a voluntary nonpartisan organization of the Virginia School Board promoting excellence in public education through advocacy, training, and service. Uh, the following school board members are receiving an award of recognition for their commitment to effective school board governance through their participation in VSBA School Board Academy. So I will pass them down as I recognize those who are receiving some recognition this evening. Uh, the first one is to Mr. Anderson. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I'll walk this one down to Ms. Gill. Ms. Litton. I'll take this one uh, for uh, Mr. Webb. Congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I will return the favor. And the last one is to our superintendent, Dr. Okay. Noonan. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And uh, in the now new tradition of VSBA wanting to have us do the welcome back photo, uh, if John will come up and we'll grab those posters and he'll tell us where he wants us to stand at. They're on the uh, podium. We did it last year. Uh, the welcome back. Just to sign this hashtag, welcome back. There's three of them. Oh, there's no hashtag? Is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, back to school VA. There you go. Bunch up over here trying to get closer, closer to the light. Come to the light. Yeah, join. Yep, no, you're good. Yeah, good, just like that. Just like that. Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. Very good. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, next, in accordance with school board, pop, excuse me, school board bylaw 2.30, the time for each for speaker is limited to three minutes. Additional written statements may be submitted to the clerk for dissemination to the board, to board members, and for the record and the dissemination of requests. Uh, are there anyone in the audience for public comment this evening? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, if someone would please read us into close. All right. 
Mr. Chair, pursuant Ms. to the Grant. Virginia... Mr. Anderson, if you... There you go. Pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose, to discuss or consider the identified subject matter. Personnel under section 2.2-3711A1. In particular, staff appointments, staff reassignments, staff resignations, staff retirements, staff performance, staff change in position, child care leave, long-term medical leave, leave of absence, and advisory committee appointments. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. There a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Gill. Okay. All right, Ms. Gill. And Mr. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Castillo? Yes. Ms. Gill? Aye. Ms. Litton? Aye. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. And Mr. Webb? Yes. Thank you. It's going to be really short. All right. And we should be a uh, brief time here. Whereas the City of Falls Church Public School Board has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to the affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provision of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2-3711B of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law, now therefore be it resolved that the Falls Church City Public Schools hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification applies and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Is there a second? Aye. Aye, second. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Castillo. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Ms. Mr. Castillo? Aye. Ms. Gill? Aye. Ms. Litton? Aye. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. And Mr. Webb? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're we'll, going to go to the consent agenda. Um, as unanimous extent that we approve the consent agenda. All right. Without objection, so ordered. All right. Now on to. <coughs> The business and information, uh, April 2001, uh, back to school update, Dr. Newman. All right. Well, we are we are back. Congratulations um, to all of our staff and faculty and our families and our students uh, on making their way back for our annual pilgrimage back to school um, the day after Labor Day. Um, and I'm excited to report um, that we that we had one of the sans a, a power outage. Uh, for a little while at Mount Daniel, some uh, AC that went down at Mount Daniel in the 1950s portion of the building and in the new tower at Thomas Jefferson. You take those pieces out and uh, we had a very smooth opening. So our, <laughs> our kids were uh, in classes and working hard from, from the very first day. Uh, our teachers were well planned and, and ready to go when they, uh, those kids walked through the door. And so it was really a lot of fun the first day of school, making making our rounds through each of the schools and seeing how engaged everybody was right from the start. And seeing the smiling faces and the happy sounds of school just sort of put life back into perspective and reminded us why, why we're here and why we exist as a school system. So I'm proud to report that uh, we are off and running. Now we will um, sort of sort through the rest of this week and into next um, because nothing like a good hurricane to sort of mess with the second week of school. But um, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I, I want to first start by um, sort of saying, again, off to a great start and talk a little bit about the culture of our schools. Um, we have, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, we really have some extraordinary leaders in our schools. And, and when I think about leadership um, in, in our buildings, I think about every, every person in the building can serve in a really strong leadership capacity. Um, whether you're a, a custodian, a bus driver, a social worker, a, an instructional assistant, a teacher, an administrator, uh, we all have these leadership potentials that we bring to the mix. And as we were making our rounds the first day of school, some of the things we saw was um, everybody stepping in and everybody stepping up and everybody really engaging kids in a really powerful way. So I want to just take a second to thank our support leaders 
um, who are out there. You know, we had a ton of work that was done this summer to one, get the buildings ready. So our custodians did a great job. Um, our food service prepara uh, preparation was incredible this year to be ready. Uh, our bus routes actually went off without a hitch. We had, we had one little hiccup um, with a JTP bus the first day, but that was sort of taken care of the, the next day. Um, and our daycare uh, is working along and for the most part, the technology has been moving too. So our support employees um, have a, have a and, and of course our, and SEVI as well, did really a ton of work leading up to the start of the school year and it really made for a smooth, smooth opening. Um, our teachers really worked hard um, the first, first week back before the students came. Our, all of our teachers were back that week. Uh, prior to that week, our brand new teachers were in for a week and sort of getting their feet on the ground and understanding sort of the way we do things here in the city of Falls Church Schools um, gave them a leg up and, and uh, we're really well prepared as well. And our administrative team um, did a lot of planning this summer and worked very closely with each other to ensure that smooth opening. So um, you take all of those pieces and put them together and it was sort of a recipe for success in that first week. Um, and we're really proud of, proud of our, our staff and, and faculty. Um, then our students came and um, I, it, was, it was like everything was right in the world again, right? Because they, you just knew um, as, as students walked through that door uh, with smiles on their faces and excited to not only see each other, but to see some of the teachers um, was really, really exciting. And, and uh, at George Mason High School, as an example, by 8.15, I took a picture and I posted it up on Twitter. Halls were cleared, kids were in classrooms, and we were, we were rolling. So uh, they were ready and, and we were ready for them. And so we, we thank our students for being ready and, and also our parents, lastly. Uh, our parents did a tremendous job getting our kids to school and getting them prepared and ready, ready to come back. Um, we welcomed some new leaders. Um, Tim Kasich at Mount Daniel uh, is new this year. Uh, he's in the running for first year principal of the year here in the city of Falls Church. Um, he of course is the only one, but we're not telling him that, um, but did have a nice opportunity to welcome him. Um, we also had a, a lot of new teachers join our system this year. Um, and here they're broken out by, by school. Um, so you'll kind of get a chance to see who they are, some of the smiling faces and they were in, like I said, a week before all of the staff came back and uh, were really a really great group of teachers to work with. Really excited, energized, are coming with some fresh perspectives, some really nice new ideas um, of how we can continue to refine our work together. So um, these are them. We, we had 44 total new um, faculty this year, um, which is a, a relatively large number, but not outside of the norm um, too much for, for what we normally have. Um, and we opened the school year this year 100% staffed, and we were excited about that. We were waiting for one person's final paperwork to come through, but um, they, were, they were hired, so we were excited about that. Here you'll see some pictures. This is at JTP on um, the first day. You'll see some of the kids working away, having a good time. We've got Rachel Hamburger uh, on, on the floor with our, our great speech and language pathologist as well. Um, here you'll see Mount Daniel. Um, and, and by the way, you'll notice in the picture at Mount Daniel, this is coming through the new door uh, in the upper left and the new hallway going down uh, towards the, the new wing, which is in the old part here, uh, which is very exciting. And our uh, kids are smiling and happy. Uh, at Thomas Jefferson, here we've got a picture of Lawrence. He followed us around, which was really great to have you uh, with us that first day as well. Um, but this is one of my favorite pictures every year. The last couple of years I've been here, is this one looking out from the top of the steps, looking down the path to Oak Street. You know, they just are coming in and they're like ready to go uh, and, and working hard. And then here we are at Henderson um, and you'll see some of the students with their, getting their lockers ready. We've got some organizational structures happening. We've got a girl who's got her uh, A day, B day schedule up in her locker. And then over here, um, this classroom was working on what does learning look like, what does learning feel like, and really sort of engaging in reflective practice around, around learning, which was a lot of fun. Uh, so sorting out the lockers and, and talking about learning. Uh, and here we are at, at George Mason High School, our seniors of 2019, sort of doing their uh, chalk work. I don't know if you had a chance to get over to George Mason in the last week or so, but there tends to be a lot of chalk uh, all over. It did wash away. <laughs> Well, that's too bad. Yeah, I'm sure we'll see more of it. But not uh, all of it. The pillar by the front door. So. <laughs> there you go. And here you'll see them. Uh, our students really happy and ready to go, ready to learn. 
Um, some of the major projects that we completed this year, um, the big one at Thomas Jefferson was the new playground. Uh, we want to thank the daycare uh, and community uh, group for, for paying for that um, out of their budget. And we'll talk more about that tonight when I do the budget update. Um, but that was uh, not unlike the new playground at, uh, at Mount Daniel. The kids were coming into the summer program every day and it was fenced off with the orange sort of snow fencing you see. And uh, it was really funny because you'd come through and it's got holes in it. And you'd see these eyes peering through the holes, looking at the, the playground as it was getting done. So the first day when it opened, it was very exciting. Um, at George Mason, uh, we did some work uh, in the restrooms in the uh, stadium. And so you'll see here, we added some LED lights, some touchless faucets, uh, hand dryers and the like. Uh, we also did a new bottle filling fountain uh, in the building. Um, these were big deals for us this summer, by the way. And then of course, uh, the biggest of all the deals was Mount Daniel. Um, and here we say new everything, it's really not new everything, but uh, it feels really, really new. So. Um, in the new main office, which we uh, were able to open, fortunately, uh, before school started, um, there you'll see the new security vestibule. So when you come in, you go right into a vestibule that's secure. The Securitas officer is sitting there and sort of engaging people as they come through. Uh, we put in new card readers, access readers across the building. Uh, we have some new furniture throughout the building. We've got new cafeteria tables. We've got some new uh, desks and chairs that are coming for the new addition uh, and the like. We also did the renovation to the 1950s portion, uh, which meant that we brought the bathrooms up to ADA compliant. So if you might remember in the old kindergarten classrooms in the 1950s, they were really small bathrooms. Those were all sort of dismantled and then uh, new bathrooms were put in there. We also included new carpet in the 1950s um, section and then also new tile through the whole building so that it ties nicely the building together from front to back and back to front. And in the, new, in the 2005 building, we also updated the tile and updated the carpet. So when you go in, it really looks like a truly articulated building from uh, throughout. Uh, just a quick update for, the, for, for you all and for the community. We are in the, um, we continue to work with Grunley uh, and Samaha Architects. Uh, we're on target for a mid-October um, co substantial completion date of the new addition. We are hoping that we'll be able to begin utilizing some of the building in mid-October. So using the cafeteria, using the gymnasium, using the media center. Uh, and then as time progresses through the fall, um, talking about how we might be able to move in to the new addition, perhaps before the winter break. Um, and there's some residents from the staff who are really excited to potentially move from the trailers into the new building. Um, there also are some folks that are a little bit nervous about it, um, but I, I think as we continue to see the new building come online, um, more and more people will be excited about it. So anyway, um, it's happening and it's, uh, and it's, it's really uh, turning out to be a, a quite a beautiful building. Uh, and when you walk into the 50s portion of Mount Daniel, uh, you would be hard pressed to know that you're in the 1950s portion of Mount Daniel with the exception of the subway tile that's along the wall. You know, you know when you see that, you're in the 50s portion, but all the classrooms have new tile, have new carpet, um, and really look nice. And then at Mount Daniel, also, we have the new playground. It doesn't look like this anymore. It's open. Uh, it opened on Monday, yesterday. And uh, so if you can picture this, we should have updated our pictures, but there's mulch. So one example is uh, right here. This, this chair uh, is about two feet uh, high, full of mulch just to give you a sense of how deep that mulch is. It's about 24 inches of, of mulch there. So anyway, the kids were on it yesterday and today having a great time. Um, I wanted to talk through just some early enrollment numbers, but before I do, I wanna be really clear about what I'm sharing with you tonight. Um, one, of the, one of the concerns about um, massive transparency is sometimes you set yourself up for uh, questions that are maybe not necessary. <laughs> Um, but I, I'm going to share some comparative data from last year to this year, which actually is apples and oranges. And the reason that it's apples and oranges is because last year's data was the September 30th numbers, not the, not the first day of school numbers. Uh, and what we know about our community and, and all communities in Northern Virginia is that over the first month of school, students continue to enroll. Um, so while our numbers may look low right now, we fully anticipate that they are going to fill out. 
uh, and they'll look more like or beyond what the um, last year's September 30 numbers are. But I thought it was important to at least share with you kind of what, what we're tracking towards. Um, so as you look at uh, this, this chart, you'll see the 2017 um, Jesse Thackeray Preschool, for example, was at 73 at the, at the uh, September 30th mark. Uh, our projection this year was at 70, and right now we're at 66. So we are four down there, um, but continuing to grow and rolling kids every day. Uh, Mount Daniel, 351, up to uh, 367 for our projections, and right now we sit at 346. Um, J Thomas Jefferson, 816, 837 was the projection. Right now we're at 783. Um, at Henderson, 603, 608, and 606. So that's very close to projection. Um, and we are really close to projection at George Mason High School as well with uh, 836 last year on September 30th, 859 is the projection and 853. So overall, we are uh, down 25 students. Um, again, we have three more weeks of enrollment to make, the, make this an apples to apples comparison and we continue to enroll new students uh, each day. Uh, just to give you a sense of where they are by the numbers and by the grade, and uh, as I've talked this through previously in previous years, one of the things that I would call your attention to is sort of the cohort. Um, so, for example, the 20, um, J take JTP out of it, um, but if you look at kindergarten, for example, uh, the 2017-2018 kindergarten enrollment was 167, and if you look at the first grade enrollment this year, it's 182. Um, so those are cohorts of kids. In theory, they're cohorts of kids. So we're gaining more first graders than we had kindergartners last year, if that makes sense. Uh, and that is not uncommon because a lot of folks in our community will do private kindergarten and then send their students to us for uh, first grade. Um, but you'll see uh, and get a sense for kind of where the numbers play out. Uh, we are down seven currently at JTP, as I indicated before, three down, two down, about even in second grade, plus three at uh, third grade, minus 58 in fourth grade. Again, but if you look at the cohort, we went from 184 to 176. So that cohort is only down uh, eight students. And the next year, you see where, or the next grade in fifth grade, we're up 22, but that's actually down three from the fourth grade cohort the prior year, if that makes any sense. So hopefully that makes some sense. So in total at the pre-K five, we are down uh, 45 students. Here you'll see it by uh, middle school. Um, and here you'll see kind of the same algorithm if you think about it in terms of on the diagonal. Um, but sixth grade uh, last year was 204. We're at 196 this year. And if I flip back to the fifth grade cohort last year, it was 209. Um, so we are, are down about 15 students in that cohort. Um, seventh grade, 185 up to 211. 8th grade, 214, 199, and then you'll see at the high school, up 10, up 8, down 8, up 1, and up 14 um, total in the secondary schools. So um, I share these data with you just to kind of give you a sense of what the numbers on day one are compared to the end of the month last year, uh, and also to sort of cautiously share them um, because, again, this is not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, but I'll come back at the end of September and update you with uh, uh, more apples to apples enrollment numbers uh, from, from previously. So uh, any questions about those enrollment numbers before I move ahead? Mr. Castillo? Thanks, Dr. Uh, I guess, first of all, there was an article in the Washington Post last week about enrollment numbers being notoriously hard to calculate. And in, in Maryland especially, there were a lot more students than were anticipated. I'd rather have this problem. Um, but I, just a question, why, what, what does it look like if you compare projected uh, or, or pre-September 30th numbers from last year with these numbers? We didn't do that analysis. Um, that's a good question, but we didn't, we didn't actually do that analysis. I can go back and look at it if you'd like. Um, no, I, I just, that, that might avoid some of the... Yeah. apples and oranges problem. But I do know from um, Marion King, who is our uh, person who does the enrollments for us, that we do tend to grow over the course of September. Uh, and it's just sort of a pattern that we've shown over time. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions? Mr. Reininger? 
I just know, like Mr. Castillo, I think it's very good news, especially if we can keep Mount Daniel enrollments um, more towards steady state. The longer we can use that building as a three school building, the better off everyone will be. So, good news. And, and just one other thing, and, and this is the, the problem is we don't have, we have small numbers to work with, so there's a lot of noise mm -hmm. in, the, in the numbers, but, but it is interesting if you, if you look at when the Great Recession happened and what the enrollment numbers are, you can kind of see mm. that the numbers of the younger classes do seem a little smaller starting in third grade. You know, they're 10 or 15 off. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether that'll be a long-term trend. I guess I guess we'll find out. Yeah. So. It'll be interesting. We continue to follow this year's fifth grade class. Um, they're sort of the, they're the, I, I think they're the Snowmageddon class. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was the last really big one, for sure. So that sort of leads us to this last collage, just sort of a, a bunch of our folks. Uh, T, hashtag Team FCCPS is our um, motto this year. Uh, or, or as our hashtag, as Ms. Russell indicated, I might, um, I might have a problem or if I don't have a hashtag. Uh, but our motto this year really is all systems grow. And so in front of you this evening, um, you have a, a shirt from our convocation uh, this year, which has all systems grow on it. These shirts were purchased by the Ed, Ed Foundation and the Steve, Sprague, Steve and Nancy Sprague um, endowment, and we thank them for that. Um, but I, I just want to thank you also to the school board for your continued dedication and support of our schools. And uh, without your uh, leadership and the, the, leadership, the rest of the leadership of the division, Lisa, Kristen, um, Tricia, et cetera, we wouldn't um, have had the smooth opening that we did. So um, thank you all for your, your continued support as well. So with that, Mr. Chair, that wraps up my welcome back. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so next up will be the, uh, <clears throat> the proclamation on Bullying Prevention Month. And, um, there you go. All right. Um, so I will read it briefly. Before you, before you yeah. do that, can I say something? You sure can. Go Thank ahead, you, sir. Mr. Chair. Um, one of the things that we're, and, and you all hopefully this evening saw the placemat in front of you, um, and many of you are familiar with what the placemat is because we've talked about it. Uh, one of the pieces of the placemat that's really important to us is that far right uh, category that um, talks about a caring climate and community. And, and we have uh, shared with our staff through convocation, and we continue to talk about it through the, through the context of the IB program. Um, how we're making sure that our students and our teachers uh, work in an environment that's safe and secure and bully free. Um, and where we also are able to sort of take risks um, and are flexible and, um, and the like, and, and speaking in, through sort of a growth mindset. So tonight's proclamation sort of falls really nicely in line uh, with this idea of the caring community and climate. Um, we've passed this proclamation typically in October. Uh, which is sort of midway through Bullying Prevention Month. Um, so we thought we'd pass it this time before Bullying Prevention Month starts. Uh, but it does sort of speak to, I think, one of the big values that um, we are paying attention to um, going forward here in our system is making sure that our students are and teachers are working in a safe and secure and bully-free environment. So thank you for that opportunity. So I will briefly read it. Um, where is School bullying has become an increasingly significant problem in the United States and Virginia. And whereas over 25% of the youth in the United States are estimated to have to have have to estimated to be involved in bullying each year, either as bully or as the victim. And whereas an estimated 160,000 students in kin in kindergarten through 12th grade school every day due to the fear of being bullied and whereas bullying can take many forms including verbal physically physical and most recently in cyberspace and can happen in many places on and off school grounds and whereas it is important for the Falls Church City for, for Falls Church City parents students teachers and school administrators to be aware of bullying and to encourage discussions of the problems 
as school as a school as a school, as a school and as a community and whereas the Falls Church City Public School Board encourages positive behaviors to eliminate bullying now for and now therefore the Falls Church City Public School Board recognized the month of October 2018 as fall as Falls Church City Public Schools Bullying Prevention Month with the intentions that the issue of bullying and its prevention be discussed in Falls Church City Public Schools and classrooms during this time. So if someone would want to uh, move passage up the, on the proclamation, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the school board approve Proclamation 02-18, Falls Church City School Board Bullying Prevention Month, October 2018. Thank you, Ms. Gilder. Second? Second. All right. All those in favor, please signify up saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Thank you very much. And I'll be signing and passing this around. And while that's going around, we'll go ahead and move on to 8.03 FY18 final budget review. Dr. Noonan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am pinch hitting tonight uh, for Kristen Michael. So uh, if you'll bear with me as I sort of move through our fiscal year end financial report um, that you all should have in your packet. Um, there are, uh, and, and Michelle Kopik is here in case we have some other more detailed questions, but um, I'll try to move through these as quickly as I can just to kind of give you a sense of, of where we are year end. Um, this budget report uh, is, it really encompasses three um, of, our, uh, of our funds. The first is the school operating fund, which of course is the biggest one uh, that we deal with, our food services fund and our community services fund. Um, the first piece that I wanna uh, talk about is the school operating fund. And uh, here, uh, there's a sort of a macro level look and then there's more of a detailed look behind that. And so, so let me start with the macro look. Um, from the perspective of our actual revenues received this year, uh, we, we received uh, $49,279,100 in revenue. Uh, our expenditures were $48,110,703. We currently have some outstanding encumbrances for a number of things, including custodial supplies, some textbooks, uh, Arcadis, and the like, um, totaling $186,114, uh, which then ultimately leaves us an ending uh, available balance of $982,283 um, to uh, use, and we are using a portion of it for, uh, for some CIP replacement funds for the Mount Daniel project, which leaves us a, funding and a fund ending balance for our operating fund this year of $314,081. Uh, from a revenue perspective, and I'll, let me talk about revenue just for a second. Um, the operating revenue um, actually came in almost, uh, well, almost $1.3 million less than we anticipated revenue was gonna come in. And primarily that was because of uh, reduced revenue from the state. It was lower than we had originally projected. Um, and final state revenue, of course, is based on our March 31 ADM, our average daily membership, and that ADM came in a little lower than we anticipated as well. So uh, between the, the combination of less money from the state and reduced ADM, we ended up coming in with um, significantly less revenue from the state than we anticipated. However, on the good side, um, to help offset that, our expenditures in our operating budget um, was two point, almost $2.4 million lower than we had budgeted as well. So we got less revenue, but we also spent less in the expenditure category. Uh, and that really came down to a, a, a number of factors. And I, I wanna take a step back to probably nine, eight, nine months ago when Deirdre McLaughlin was here as our acting CFO. One of the things that Deirdre was able to do as we were going through the budget process was to really go through our budget with a fine tooth comb. And so what she ended up doing was um, digging into salaries, digging into benefits um, in a line by line way. So we looked at every single employee that was in the system and put in their actual salary, and put in their actual benefit, um, as opposed to using sort of an average um, salary and benefit, which had been the methodology previously. 
So by utilizing that one-to-one -one methodology and really digging in person by person, uh, we were able to determine that there was um, in salaries about 3.1% lower uh, necessary for the salary account um, than budgeted, about 3.7% lower uh, than other expenditures, including um, some contingencies, which ended up um, significantly lower. So we were able to save some money in that salary and that benefit file that we weren't anticipating because we were able to go line by line. So what we ended up doing essentially was rebasing, uh, if you will, our employee funds, uh, salary and, and benefits. So when you take that amount that um, we ended up with, the 390, let's say 314,081, um, and add it to um, our year end balance from the prior year, uh, we will have a fund balance moving forward in FY19 of 1.6 million dollars. Um, let, me, let me back up just for a second because uh, we, we ended up obviously with um, a little bit more than we anticipated that we were going to have because of the salary rebasing, um, $982,283, and we spent $668,000 out of the operating fund to make up for some shortfall at Mount Daniel. And I want to take just a second to talk about those. I touched on them briefly earlier in the presentation when I was doing the back to school report. But I, I want to make sure that you understand um, sort of the narrative that I've been trying to share with people. And that is that there were a number of things that um, came to our attention through the Mount Daniel project that weren't part of the original uh, GMP or the uh, greatest maximum price contract that had been developed prior to my arrival. And some of those things were, uh, for example, furniture, fixtures and equipment. There wasn't any money in the contract for ff and &E. Um, there wasn't any um, furniture or any uh, money in the contract for any upgrades to um, bathrooms in the 1950s building. So when we got to a place where uh, those 1950 bathrooms really needed to be renovated to make them ADA compliant, we had to come up with the funding to be able to do that. Um, and then there is the uh, water storage tank that I think everybody here is familiar with. If you haven't been up to Mount Daniel, you'll see it. It looks like a a big metal tank, and it's um, actually much nicer looking than I thought it was going to be, to be perfectly honest. But that that tank is there to hold water so that we are able to pass our fire safety and, and life safety inspections to be able to open the new addition at Mount Daniel. And that um, water storage tank ended up costing us ended up costing us about eighty nine thousand, almost ninety thousand dollars. Grundley picked up a portion as well, um, so we shared the cost in that. And then there were a few other expenses, for example, rekeying the building wasn't part of the GMP originally as well, uh, and security systems, card readers and the like weren't uh, also. So we really felt like those were some things that had to be taken care of uh, for this school to really function um, as, a, as what we were hoping it would be, sort of a new, new addition, sort of new school. So some of that money uh, that we ended up with at year end was spent towards some of those expenditures. And I just wanted to make sure that you all understood that that was where that money was spent. I think I've talked about it previously. So in the end, um, we have a, a healthy fund balance moving forward into FY19. Um, that $1.617 million represents um, about 2% on our budget. Um, I got a question earlier from a school board member asking how does that compare to surrounding jurisdictions? Um, I had a chance to talk to two of our neighbors uh, who all try to carry between 2 and 3% of their budget um, as carryover uh, to take care of any unmet needs or any unforeseen circumstances. Um, and so we are right in what would be considered industry standard uh, with respect to carryover. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of where we are with the operating budget. I don't know if you want me to stop there, if there are questions about the operating budget, or should I just go ahead and continue into the food services? Because the operating budget is really the big one. Do have any questions before we move on to the next portion? Or do you prefer to, or do you prefer to just wait and get the full presentation? I can go now. Go, go, you want to go you now? Go, go ahead. So, so Dr. Noonan, with respect to the salaries, <coughs> um, the estimates are one thing, but wouldn't, wouldn't it come out in the wash as a result of the budget process anyway at the end of the year? Um... I think that's what happened this year. Is it? But I mean, it would happen any year, wouldn't it? I mean, you, you might say we think it's X. It turns out it's 
you know, 0.97x. But, mm -hmm. but then at the end of the year, yes, you'd, you'd have that show up. Yes, you, you are correct that it would wash out. This year, however, we created our budget based on actual salaries as opposed to averages. So what we anticipate moving forward now is having less fallout because we're, we're much more refined in the knowledge of what our salaries and benefits are by employee, if that makes sense. So rather than taking the average, we're trying to do it. The methodology now is to rebase around actuals. And then you'll update it every year on actuals? Yes. Okay. That's the it sounds like a lot of work. But it is. It is a lot of work. Um, we'll, we'll review it every year. I don't know if we'll update it every year. We might start to fall into a new rhythm. Um, but we'll, we'll work through that as the year goes by, and we'll okay. update you on that as well. Thanks. Mr. Anderson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Dr. Noonan, another way of thinking about it, if I'm getting you right, is basically that you've developed a more refined model for the budget going forward, and that's giving you more precise information that ended up being... You had, the cost actually went down, but next year that model is much more precise and maybe a lot closer to what the end of the budget looks like. We anticipate we'll be much closer than we were this year okay. because of that. Yep. Ms. Russell? So for on the, I guess it's the revenue side of it, mm -hmm. um, I understand about the federal and state city transfers, out of it. what is the other bucket? So I see that other was down by 778,000. Mm -hmm. So what would other consist of? Uh, it's not I'm gonna ask federal. Michelle to, to chime in. That could be, is that lottery? So the actual that was budgeted for was two million, and the actual was 1.2. So we were down 778, 465 in that other category. Yeah, I'm just wanting to make sure I have the just wanting to make sure I have the right file open here. Mm -hmm. So I want to give a precise answer. The other way we could handle this is we could also get back to you if, if that. So, um, so there are, I, I think it would be clearest if we got back to you Let's because there are a number of miscellaneous. I think if we just went down the list, it could get confusing. So we can certainly give the detail. Yeah, we'll provide that for you. Any other questions before we move on? That's the problem with pinch hitting. <laughs> I don't have it as committed to memory. I know, she would rattle it off. All right, All right. Dr. Levy. Sure, the next is the food services fund. Um, and I think we've reported to you in the quarterly or in the uh, monthly updates that we knew um, that the food services fund was gonna come in um, under budget. So you'll see the revenue received here was 799,028. The actual expenditure was 862,924, leaving us uh, an ending balance of, of negative 63,896, which means that um, the food services fund has a year-end balance from previous, so they will they have to dig into that year-end balance to make themselves whole. Um, one of the things that I want to make sure that the board is aware of is that we are working very closely with the food services team. Um, and are excited about some of the new uh, ideas that are coming forward to uh, in further engage our community uh, around food service, um, looking at different models of uh, providing lunch. Um, I don't know if you saw the morning announcements, but we've started breakfast again at 740 in the morning. Um, so hopefully the breakfast program will pick up. Um, we also are gonna, uh, looking forward to opening the cafeteria at, at Mount Daniel, which will be really nice uh, to have that up and running again. Um, but we anticipate um, next year that, uh, and, and I know this is something that Richard cares a lot about, um, is making sure that uh, he does not end in a negative next year. So um, be on the lookout for um, some new and exciting ways of food preparation and more importantly, food delivery uh, here in the city of Falls Church Schools. Um, and then the last is the Community Services Fund. Uh, here you'll see the actual revenues um, that were received were 
uh, 1.964979. Uh, the actual expenditures were 1.883304 less some encumbrances that they have, which are 376,958, leaving them in an ending balance of negative 295,283. Uh, you may recall from a couple of months ago, we came and asked you to do a budget adjustment for uh, the Community Services Fund because uh, the daycare has been kind enough to pay for uh, the playground at Thomas Jefferson and also pay for the playground at Mount Daniel because they are used by the after school programs and before school programs. Um, so that is why they're actually ending in a negative. So they are digging into their their ending balance from previous. They're actually their beginning balance from the year before, um, and they had they had it to be able to um, to to dig into. So and they will still begin the year with um, over a million dollars in ending balance. So they're in, they're in very good shape. And again, we thank uh, the Community Services Fund for their support of of our schools. And they. They also are paying for a couple of other things, just by the way. Um, they paid for a, a water fountain at, at Mount Daniel, and I think they're also helping pay for some of the cafeteria, uh, a couple of the cafeteria tables as well. So we thank them for that. So any questions about um, either food services or community services? Questions, anyone? Mr. Reininger. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Newton, just it's really an overall question. Mm -hmm. um, the, item on the agenda sorry the item on the agenda says for information but the underlying paperwork says that um, the FCCPS is going to request the school board approve the use of one-time funding for the transfer you talked about under the operating fund mm -hmm. my question is do you need a motion and approval from the board or um, not I, I don't think so yeah okay. you did it for the um, the community services fund yeah what you haven't done is the um the operating fund piece for the expenditures at mount daniel but i don't think we need to do that on that we, we did discuss before it was like four five seven four or something mm -hmm. i think we went through the whole list mm -hmm. and had the discussion of the ada was decided and i thought we took some action yeah. oh maybe maybe you did I'd have to go back and maybe get back. Just, uh -huh. I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you on whether you took action. I, I apologize for not having. Yeah, we did something. Right I can't 100% remember. Yeah, I, I, I thought we did something as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess the main thing here is I, 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 the big idea here is that we are in good shape moving into 2019, um, and uh, and I wanted to be really transparent about where we spent some of the year-end balance as well on that project at Mount Daniel. Thank you very much. Kristen would have done much better. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, next up will be first reading, so reading of policies. I'm going to turn it right over. Turn it right over to, to Ms. Minson. Good evening. We have um, eight policies with four corresponding forms um, to present for first reading tonight. Um, as in the past, I've put together a chart that shows what the new policy or the proposed new policy is replacing of the previous policy of the school division. Um, this time, because there are so many policies that are being uh, replaced by multiple other policies, I also did another chart below that of what the new policy is and then how it relates to the previous policies. Unlike um, many of the policies that I've presented to the board and the board has adopted over the past year or so, um, there's not very clear alignment from the policies as the school board had them in the past to the model policies. And in many ways, that's a feature of um, this board's um, practice in the past of having very unique um, policies that they wanted suited to Falls Church, but not aligning with um, the same structure, the VSBA. And as we're moving towards the model policies, aligning with the VSBA structures and cross references being consistent, um, I think this this will likely be the most um, meaty policy review we've done to date and probably the most in-depth one um, that we will do for the next year or so. Um, so I welcome, I, I appreciate your patience and I welcome any feedback that you have. Um, and I do appreciate the board members that have been in touch with questions and, and um, 
and concerns and, and certainly want to address those and come back on second reading um, with those changes incorporated. So um, I guess without further ado and with a bit of trepidation diving into policy JFHA GBA um, it, and overall actually before getting into that um, these proposed model policies if adopted for first reading today and second reading in October would replace the um, policies under policy um, section one of the current policies so the idea is these are the school board policies the the goals of the board going forward of non-discrimination of um, equal education equal employment prohibition um, of discrimination of individuals with um, section 504 plans but also the educational philosophy and the legal status um, and the goals and objectives so I guess with that overarching that, that there's a whole lot of ground to cover um, JFHA GBA is the first policy um, this is one that I know um, a number of you had wanted to be presented with earlier um, we um, were working with the Office of Civil Rights for the United States Department of Education to amend this policy and it took a while to get feedback and I think we're all on the same page that we shared with OCR that the first reading would be um, tonight, second reading and adoption it would likely be in October. Any changes that the board makes to this policy I do anticipate we will send to OCR to give them a heads up but um, this, the one thing I did not do in this policy is show the red line differences between the VSBA model policy and um, the proposed policy for the board because some of those were changes that the Office of Civil Rights had recommended that we thought made sense for our division going forward. And I did share with um, Liz, Elizabeth Ewing, the attorney for VSBA, the changes that um, we were proposing to make in this minor setting. They likely will be changed the model policies in some ways to reflect um, the advice of the Office of Civil Rights and best practices for supporting um, Title IX and ensuring that there's no discrimination against our employees or our students on the basis of gender or sex. So. Um, that's policy JFHA GBA um, and this and three other policies in addition to prohibiting harassment and retaliation they are accompanied by a form where if someone from the community if a student if a parent if a teacher does feel harassed they can fill out that form there are compliance officers and there's a step-by-step -step, um, description of both what the what harassment is so a definition of harassment um, and the complaint procedure both formal procedures and informal procedures what is involved in the investigation um, once the investigation is completed by a principal or a compliance officer that goes to the superintendent for review and a decision and there's also an appeal right for either the um, the um, respondent so the person who is accused of harassment or the victim um, to appeal a decision if they disagree with the decision of the superintendent that does come before the school board for review so um, we hope to spell out as clearly as possible um, what individuals should do if they, they um, are concerned with discrimination or harassment under the various classes. So just looking at um, JFHA, GBA, welcome any questions either about the language or about what the process looks like um, and happy to take this as, as slowly as we need to to make sure that we get this right. Um, one thing that um, I want to be very clear on is the division never has supported harassment any kind but we want it to be if, if a student has a concern if a staff member has concerns we want these to be very clear what they do um, what an individual does to raise a claim and what we will do to respond to that to make sure there's not retaliation um, to make sure there are interim measures in place and that we support all of our our community our students our staff um, so questions with this first policy prohibition against harassment and retaliation any questions, anyone? Ms. Russell? <laughs> so I guess my first questions have to do with this specific policy, but then I guess mm -hmm. it kind of ties into the next one that we're going to look at. Mm -hmm. But in this, it just opens with um, prohibits harassment against students, employees, or others. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming by others, you were talking about maybe contractors, or are you also going so far as to include visitors such as parents, volunteers, it's, I mean, I know that in other parts of it, it mentions that, but I wasn't sure, like, what encapsulates others from a Title IX standpoint? From, I can't answer that from a Title IX standpoint, but as far as this policy is concerned, if a concern is raised by a contractor, by a visitor, by a parent, mm -hmm. um, anyone who's coming in contact with our school, if that discrimination happens in the school context or as it relates to our, our school or our students, we would look into that. Okay. Um, 
what we have control over, what we would react to, um, would depend upon what the claim is um, and who is alleged to have been involved in it. But uh, the purpose of, of this and all of the anti-discrimination policies is to make sure that discrimination and harassment in any form um, within the boundaries of our school, within the walls of our school, or that impacts the, the instructional day and impacts our school in that way are addressed. And, um, and in addressing it, there's no retaliation against anyone who's raising the complaint or um, has the concerns or is involved as a witness. Okay, so in that case, would it make sense? I mean, obviously we don't need an exhaustive list of who the others are, mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering if it makes sense to include something along the lines of volunteers or you know contract something mm -hmm. that expands it a little bit broader at least in the initial definition mm -hmm. and how that looks at you know the model policy or if they just use the generic others it's just I guess I was just thinking like as a let's say if I was a parent mm -hmm. volunteering in the school and I felt I was sexually harassed I don't know mm -hmm. it would be kind of fuzzy for me whether since I'm not an employee or a student whether others really fit into the category or not. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how far we want to kind of expand that to the general, usual people you might find at the school. Mm -hmm. So I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I'm wondering whether others included as part of the policy statement makes sense, but then when you're looking at what the mm -hmm what we have authority to take action against when you look down um yeah and i guess that would be another question too is i where you know what where the line is in terms of mm -hmm. right i i do think that looking so at line um 28 of page one that the school division will investigate it goes on to say um, at school or school sponsored activity, then under definitions, so page two, um, line six and seven, if the conduct relates to um, obtaining or retaining employment, um, or nine or 10 relates to individual employment or education. So I wonder if that solves your concern by breaking out the, the definition of conduct that relates to the school, occurs within school, impacts employment or educational environment, if that covers it or if you would want it to be more specific in the policy statement too. <laughs> I guess not to get too deep in this because mm -hmm. this is obviously a little uncomfortable, but if there's some way in the definition that we could also make reference to not just an individual's employment or education, but I don't know. I mean, I guess I would wonder how that would fit under um, a student's parent. So, for instance, I mean, I'm assuming that mm -hmm. someone who is a guardian or parent of a student and how that kind of, am I making sense? <laughs> um, I think I, I understand what so you're getting not, at. Some concern is we don't have control over what parents say or what parents do. We have control over what our employees do and-, and Right, but if it's an employee in, saying or do something to a parent as a condition of the student's education. Certainly a parent could file a complaint, but, mm -hmm. but I don't, I worry about expanding this to um, control the behavior of parents or third parties who aren't being educated in our school or being employed by us. So if the concern is that a staff member was harassing a parent, that mm -hmm. certainly would fall under this. If it's a parent is harassing a staff member, I think that's a different, a different process. And we do have, um, I, just trying to think hypothetically what that would fall under. We have right. resources in place to support staff so they can get their job done. And if we needed to, to put, if, if a parent or third party was harassing a teacher, we would, we would take the steps necessary in order to protect that teacher while allowing the parent or third party to, to exercise their First Amendment rights in a way that doesn't create a hostile environment for our staff members and perhaps limiting their contact with the teacher or having all contact go through an administrator. But I don't think that that falls um, into here. I wonder if um, if there's specific, one of the challenges in adopting these or looking to adopt these policies is trying to figure out if a situation arose, where would that fall? And right, does this yeah. make sense if you walk through um, situations that have arisen in school divisions in the past, or perhaps the situation that you're thinking about that 
we could walk through that. I don't know if now would be the best yeah, we can talk about time that. to do that. If you have perhaps a, a concrete example that doesn't fit in here and, and we should have something else for, or perhaps we have another medium to go through it. But okay. I don't feel like that's a very good answer to your question, but maybe yeah, it'll be no, good enough I, for we now. We can talk more about it. Okay. Separately. Happy to. Mr. Reininger. So it's just, I had not previously thought of this, but based on Ms. Russell's question, um, it, it feels to me like others is pretty broad in the initial mm -hmm. sentence. Mm -hmm. But if you go down to line 24 through 26 on page one, it says, for, for the purpose of this policy, school personnel include school board members, sorry, above that, um, is a, line 13 to 14, is a violation of this policy for any student or school personnel to harass a student or school personnel based on sex, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, et cetera. Um, the, and school personnel would cover, I think, most of, the, most of the folks that are within our control, including volunteers. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that, I'm not sure why it wouldn't say something about a student's family in lines 13 to 14. Mm -hmm. um, because that just says student or school personnel, and school personnel is defined fairly broadly to not include, but not to include mm -hmm. parents. Mm -hmm. and so I don't know if that ought to be, I think it's probably just something to be looked at, but mm -hmm. I, I think the point that maybe that should say in line you know, mm -hmm. 14, um, harass a student, student's family, or something, something along the lines that captured that a little bit more broadly. Okay. Uh, one concern I have with that, I, I don't want to be the attorney that, that says any type of harassment is permissible because we don't want our staff harassing parents. We don't want our students harassing parents, although that might look different depending upon your age of your child or your relationship with your child. But this really needs to be related to speech at school. This, and, and, and I worry that when you get into, as it's written now, it's consistent with case law and with Title IX as far as what happens in our schools or what's brought in to impact instruction can be our purview to investigate, to review, to put in place certain standards. And I, I do worry about, and, and I think we can wordsmith it so that we can keep it narrowly ta tailored, but if a, a student says something even in the context of school that's untoward about another student's parent or that that's hostile, I, I don't know if that's the type of language that we need to be addressing through a Title IX policy um, to prohibiting harassment based on on gender or or sex but maybe it is so i mean what i what i would worry about is for example school personnel which could include of course volunteers school board members mm -hmm. harassing the parent of a kid or you can imagine a teacher or a staff member mm -hmm. harassing the parent of a child um, and i'm not sure based on the language right now whether that would be covered and it feels to me like it ought to be mm -hmm. And it would be harassing based on a, a legally protected status, as, yes. right? Um, let's let's give that some thought and see if I'll, I'll both do some legal research and see if there's some language where we can narrowly tailor it to relate to what happens in the context of schools. Because I, I think it's the right thing to do, and I appreciate the sentiment. I also worry about what that will mean as far as investigations and review and, and resources for supporting students. Mr. Castillo. Well, I, I think. I think others in line seven, or, yeah, line seven is pretty broad. Mm -hmm. I think they're t we can make it as broad as we want, mm -hmm. but then you're going to run into the, the jurisdiction of the school board mm -hmm. uh, on this. So you mm -hmm. could say maybe others within the jurisdiction or control or power of the school board. Mm -hmm. But I think you know others is pretty broad. I, I understand. Mm -hmm. I, I think this policy. To the extent it's limited or focused on Title IX, should probably say that sooner rather than later. If you do a mm -hmm. word search for Title IX, it yeah, it's is not nowhere to be found. The compliance officer, that's yeah, true. Yeah, so you, you might want to bump that up. Yeah. And then I also had this this thought at like four in the afternoon, so I didn't share it. That's okay. Uh, and that is, how does this mesh with the earlier policy that we came up with a few weeks ago about, I think the term is hostile work environment. Yes. And, and I know they're different, but mm -hmm. you know the hostile work environment policy doesn't have a process mm -hmm. associated with this. Mm -hmm. So another question I have is: Should each grounds for complaint have its own 
complaint process for clarity or should we have a catch-all process that, that is cross-referenced or how should we do that? That is a good question um, and something that Dr. Noonan and I were talking about and I, um, I spoke with Elizabeth Ewing of the VSBA to ask why there's a separate policy for prohibition of harassment and retaliation and you're right this doesn't say Title IX and I think it makes sense to put that in there. Um, but this is a separate Title IX policy, anti-harassment discrimination, that really seems focused on gender and um, sex. But then you also have prohibition of harassment in education, prohibition of harassment in employment, prohibition of harassment in hiring, or in um, students with disabilities in Section 504 students. And I asked, why are they four different policies with some different processes to them? Um, rather than one policy and she said back when she took over her position about 20 years ago um, everything was done in paper and if someone in paper was looking to make sure that a staff member wasn't discriminated against they'd look in the personnel section versus a student would look in the student section we don't have that challenge now because we can cross name and everything's on the internet so we could have a policy JFHA GBA GB JB that covers EEOC claims and and is the same policy consistently throughout saying we're not going to discriminate and it's all of these protected classes that we've chosen to identify and that the law protects um, and and streamline it that way i do think title nine needs to have its own carve out as far as um, certain claims such as sexual harassment can't be subject to the informal procedure for students with disabilities under um, section 504 of the rehabilitation act does need to have a 45 day reporting window instead of the 15 day window but otherwise, one thing that um, I got Dr. Noonan's blessing to present, even though this is eight different policies, four of which have to do with harassment, one idea would be to bring it back either for a second reading in October or a, a second reading and then follow up with a third reading um, of making this all one policy that says we don't discriminate and then breaks it out as it needs to. Um, I know we're trying to hew closely to the VSBA model policies. If we did turn it into one policy, it means that we'd want to make sure that our cross-references at the bottom of each of the um, sections is consistent, so it would require a little bit more work. But if that makes it easier um, to have just one policy of prohibition of harassment and retaliation, that's certainly something I'm willing to do. I don't know if that... I feel like I went a little bit beyond what your question was, but... Um, I think we just need to think about if, if somebody's going to try to use these policies, mm -hmm. we should make it as user-friendly as possible. And, and I guess the other thing I would mm -hmm. say, with all due respect to BSBA, mm -hmm. I, I would rather do it right than do it BSBA's way. Okay. And, and often that seems to be a choice you have to make. Right. And this is one where if we're going to... I, I appreciate and respect that the board sometimes has said we don't need to have this model policy. The, the Virginia Code doesn't require us to have it. This here, I think, not only do we not want to follow the VSBA, we want to make it as clear as possible. Because if someone has been discriminated against or someone has been harassed, we don't want them confused by what the process looks like. Um, so I know Mr. Anderson had given me a lot of feedback, and I know you'll jump in here about just the structure of, of the reporting and what it looks like so that as we're trying to look at this to say, heaven forbid, a student comes forward and says that they were discriminated against based on their gender, or their, their race or their national origin, what that looks like. Will, will a student and their parent be able to read this and know this is what's gonna happen next and this is who I report it to. So this is certainly more than any of the policies that I presented to the board, one where we want to make it our own and make it clear so that we do everything we can to, to keep our students safe and supported and our staff. So, so. just as a matter of clarification, is, is OCR a floor or a ceiling? Um, are we allowed to do more than what OCR says? Yeah, and that's um, a uh, that's a good question. As, as far as protected classes or as far as what we've proposed to OCR so far, or what do you? But, well, but anything. I mean, could we say you, you won't be discriminated against by, by height, mm -hmm. um, by hair color? I mean. I would caution against that. Um, for, uh, that by height, for example, example, the basketball coach might not with. want that because then when I'm 5'4 and I want to play center on the team, that could be a problem. But there are, um, one thing that this board has consistently done is added as a protected class sexual orientation and the most recently revised policy added gender identity. Those are not protected classes under Virginia or federal law, but this board has, has decided that those are going to be protected classes in the division. So um, to the extent this, your question is, can we, can we add other categories as the protected classes they're viewed under the law 
the board can and has. And I've written these policies to, in, to continue to include sexual orientation and gender identity as protected classes, which is not included in the model policies, except for one of the VSBA model policies did include gender identity. Um, and, and OCR can't stop us from doing that, I assume, I hope. No. Okay. I haven't, I haven't found a situation where they have done that. I also haven't found any situations where a board has included that as a protected class. Someone has come back and challenged that, and then OCR has found a board in violation of its own policies, but it's certainly the board has the authority to, to add other protected classes. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Gill. Um, so I want to go back to the point about others, just because I think we're not clear in our policy. In the first mm -hmm. paragraph, we say harassment against students, employees, or others. However, the next paragraph, which gets into more detail, just mm -hmm. talks about students and school personnel, which mm -hmm. we go forward to then define, mm -hmm. which does include volunteers, contractors, mm -hmm. or other persons such as supervision or, and control of the school division. It does not, it, it does make it much more narrowly defined. Mm -hmm. I don't know if in the first paragraph, should we change that from students, employees, or others to students or school personnel, because that makes it more consistent throughout the policy. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we have, we do have this confusion in the first paragraph um, that we're making this much broader when it's actually not as broad when you get further down to the policy. So could we do a parentheses after others that says um, school board members can employees, agents, volunteers, contractors? Well, we already defined that as school personnel. Mm -hmm. So we, that we've defined all those people as school personnel in line 24 of the first page. Yeah. Um, and then we use students and school personnel so that does include employees, school board members, all of those people. Um, but in the first paragraph, we're saying it's students, employees, or others. So that makes it much more vague than what we say further on. So maybe just the students and school personnel is here and defined. Right, because that the is first line because there. it is defined um, just Later two on. paragraphs down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's an idea. Would that make it clear for folks and resolve the concern with others? Um, it doesn't get into students' families, but that's a conversation we can have about does, do we need to add that or is this the place for that? And, and, and that raises a question to me. And, and when you say supervision and control of the school division, you could have some outside person making harassing remarks or something. To the extent we could ban them from the campus, are they in our control for the purposes of this policy? They're, they're not in our control, but the school's in our control. So yes, we could ban someone from our campus, but we're not controlling them. We're just saying you can do anything you want except for right here. Um, and as a practical matter, we've had a complaint from out of state about one of our employees a year or so ago, and we fully looked into it, even though neither the, the law or, or our policy then or this policy would require us to do it. So I don't want it to look like if a complaint comes in where it's not from one of these people, we're not going to address it. But, but um, Yes, technically, we would have control to keep someone out of the school if the harassment arose to the level that that were necessary, and whether it's a restraining order or a, a, you're not permitted to come without a previous appointment is something that, when I represented previous divisions, was not uncommon. Mr. Reisman. Just a little bit for clarity. There's a, there's a who we will, there's, there's the targets and the victims. Mm -hmm. I think <clears throat> I'm pretty comfortable with the um, students and school personnel for um, if they're the respondent, the person who's accused of right yes. people that we would try to say that we have responsibility to control. Mm -hmm. For the actual victims of the harassment, mm -hmm. I'm I prefer a broader definition, and there's a substantive decision there about whether or not student families ought to be included. It, it doesn't seem to me to be included in the language. Um, yeah. as is currently written um, because of lines 13 and 14 on page one, mm -hmm. as Ms. Gill referenced and I referenced earlier. Um, and I think, I think they ought to be, but although we can have that conversation. The one thing I did also want to say on the policy point, yes. um, not the policy point, the procedure point. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm particularly um, strong on copying the VSBA policies Mm -hmm. um, I, I like to do it, as you know. It's I think it's mm -hmm. better because we're, the whole idea is that we can get out of the work of updating the policy. Mm -hmm. um, if it's if it is nonsensical or it's un, not can't be followed by ordinary people, then we ought not. Yeah. Sure. Um, I would suggest a couple of things. One, that regardless that we consider doing what amounts to checklists for you know 
you know, so the policy governs, but here is the process. So it mm -hmm. could be sort of like a, a, a handout for a parent or a student or a staff member so that it is more approachable than trying to read through the multi-page legalese. The second thing I'd suggest is if we are going to go through um, the effort of trying to have a more a rational and 21st century approach mm -hmm. to these policies that we work with VSBA to get them to adopt them once we develop them because then we can get to the same endpoint but by taking by leading the VSBA towards the right place to be. Sure. Let's go. So even further to Mr. Reidinger's point. I think we have to remember too that there are um, civil and criminal remedies for a someone who's being harassed by a school employee who then will be they'll be disciplined under this policy anyway, won't they? Because they've been the subject of a criminal complaint. If if we're if aware been harassing, of it. I mean, you know, if this if someone's like, listen, this person is harassing my family, I'm going to take it to the to the police. Sure, they're going to let us know. And we're all going to be wrapped in, and they're going to is I mean, there is. I'm just this, asking you also. This policy makes clear right. that this is not the sole remedy that right. individuals okay. could file a complaint right. with OCR or the, the Virginia um, Department of Education. They could right. file state complaints. They can they can report it to the police. Right. Um, it's conceivable that there could be a harassment case or a, a, a case against, I anticipated if it was against our employee, we would know about it, but conceivably there could be some type of criminal case mm -hmm. or even civil proceeding that we don't know about until we're informed of it. but. Um, it is our sincere hope, and by putting this together, it is the expectation that harassment is, is quickly reported so right. that it can be investigated, there can be interim measures put in place, there can be support provided to everyone involved, there right. can be prohibit, uh, prohibition of retaliation. But then if a parent does have an issue, it's not saying, like, listen, because it's not in our policy, this, this teacher or whoever is not going to be um, disciplined by the school system because they still will be disciplined by the school system by virtue of having had like a criminal complaint again. You know, like it's it's going to come back through probably. Mm -hmm. That's my assumption that even if it's not later because I do think it gets a little bit sticky if it mm -hmm. I agree with I agree with Mr. Reininger that um, we obviously don't want a someone harassing a family. And I can definitely see it instances where I don't know of any, but I can imagine instances where that would happen. Mm -hmm. um, also to Ms. Reininger's point, I would I would love to see this like put on a poster, like the process put on a poster and put in the bathrooms. Mm -hmm. Um, in the locker rooms mm -hmm. so that people, kids see it every day and they know exactly what they have to do. Like, I've been harassed. I have, like, here's who I can go talk to. I, I know that there's 15 days to file because mm -hmm. that's a, you know, it may take a, a child in file to get around to mm -hmm. getting up the courage to say something so that they know that there's a time. Mm -hmm. You know, here's your safe place to go. Here's what you do. You're going to be given a form. Just so it's very clear and friendly and laid out. And again, like, it's in the bathroom so they can just, like, everybody goes to the bathroom. You don't have to talk about it. It's just in there. You you see it when you wash your hands. It's also in the locker room. So if you're in the locker room, something is happening. Mm -hmm. It's another place where there's more intimate. Particularly with gender and right. sex. Right. Um, you know, it's just so that everybody knows, like, here's what you can do. You don't have to you don't have to go onto the school board website and, and pull through a policy and try to figure out what you do about it. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also look at it privately and not have to immediately go to a counselor and say, like, I don't really know what to do. Like, you kind of already know, okay, I know what I have to do. And part of, of making this, I, I think that makes sense and is a good idea and is certainly something that we can talk about. As far as the report of harassment, there's no expectation that a student or parent must fill this form out. So we are going to be doing extensive training of our admin, of our principals and, and APs to, to share with them that if someone comes to you and a student reports something or a parent reports something, they don't have to call it a Title IX violation. They don't have to say, I felt discriminated against based on my national origin they can share what happened and the principals and the assistant principals will have the training and the knowledge to know this is a claim under our policy of our non-discrimination or harassment policy i'm going to fill out this form gather this information and work together with our title nine compliance officer or with um miss sharp to work through this to make sure that we do a full investigation that doesn't just involve talking to the respondent and the the victim that talks to teachers and other witnesses and make sure we get a full picture of this so that we put it in place the support that we need going forward. Yeah, I think that goes to Mr. Reiner's point of having like a clearly outlined like, checklist and very, you know, so the, because the policy, if you're not a lawyer reading it and, you know, should use the form, a lot of people are going to take that as must use the mm -hmm. form or should do this and say, I must do this. Mm -hmm. And that can be, I think it may be intimidating mm -hmm. for kids. And it's Trisha Longo's lines, the 15 school days, 
I mean, I'm assuming that's from the model policy as well. Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious, since there's not a limitation, I mean, I know it clearly mm -hmm. says should be made within 15 full days, but I'm just curious why. It, we added the there's no limitation. If you raise something that happened 20 years ago, we're going to look into it. Okay. Um, the language from the model policy and from um, the, the case law is 15 days. Okay. And, and that's often not enough time. Yeah, um, and I just, I guess I'm uncomfortable with even having it in there because I'm mm -hmm. just thinking if I'm a high school girl and feel that I was sexually harassed, mm -hmm. I don't know if 15 days would be enough for me mm -hmm. to get up the nerve to say something. And so if I saw 15 days in writing, mm -hmm. I might just stop reading. Like, I don't know, I just think it's mm -hmm. a little... I think to be consistent with, with the law, it we should keep 15 days in there, but we wanted to make very clear that we're not going to stop an investigation or, refu or, or refuse to investigate if it's after that time. Um, if, it's, if it's after the 15 days, sometimes it's difficult to have, um, and after the 15 days, day 16 doesn't make it more difficult, but day 45, day 145 um, makes it more difficult to put in place remedial measures, for example, because a student might not be in the same class with, with the individual who was victimizing or who was harassing them, um, or the staff member may no longer be employed by us. Um, but any complaint that we get of harassment, and that's something that wasn't required by OCR and isn't required by the model rules of saying, if we get a complaint, we're going to look into it. We might not be able to remedy it, or we might not be able to get, gather as much information about it that we could if it was reported right away. Um, but I do strongly suggest for, for board purposes of keeping the 15 days in there since that's what's required under the law. And I wouldn't want to expose you all to, to additional liability for that. But I do think that it's one of the things that I think is important is that any complaint we get, we look into regardless of how long ago it is alleged to have occurred. So thinking about the applicability of the, of the policy, right? We're, 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 I've, I've heard concerns expressed here now about what would it apply to, you know, what does the others mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, I'm thinking, I've been kind of going through a set of scenarios in my mm -hmm. head about what would happen if, what would happen if, kind of a thing. To take it to, the, to one extreme, if you had a situation where somebody who falls under a school personnel category, it's here on lines 24 to 26, is, does something harassing against a parent, mm -hmm. totally off school grounds, totally no connection whatsoever, mm -hmm. that's not necessarily something that this would cover, right? So I'm thinking that's one extreme. Another extreme would be, you know, you've got two folks who are either a student or somebody who's in the school personnel and it would, it would fall under this policy. Mm -hmm. To pick a, a specific example, think about a situation where we have um, a sport event, sporting event, or you know, robotics competition, or something like that, or a debate competition. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's happening on the on school grounds, and a parent from one team goes after a parent from another team, mm -hmm. but neither of those are people that are in the Falls Church mm -hmm. division. I guess it's happening on our grounds, but it's not involving anybody that's under here. Something like that could would be, I, I think, could be dealt with in the place of we have a policy that allows us to prevent a person from coming to our school because they are disruptive to the environment. We do, and that actually would be covered if it were, say, a robotics event that we're having at the school or a sporting event under lines, and I, the one I printed doesn't have the lines on it, so I apologize, I'm going back and forth here, but um, page one, lines 22 to 23 says, um, right. if this happens by, with third parties participating in, observing, or otherwise engaged in school-sponsored activities. So that would be one where we would follow these policies, even if it's two, two parents from two differing schools, one from our schools, one from an opposing school. Um, we would still look into that, investigate, follow these procedures. The, to the extent we have authority to um, tell them how to act or what to do might be limited, but we would still look into it um, because it did occur at, at school event or at a school-sponsored event. Activity. So for, for this particular policy, though, it would be limited to the harassment based on you know, the Title IX. Um, based on any protected status, which under this is status. sex, so sexual orientation, gender. Right, I thought you was in the video, then that yeah. would be different than, so mm -hmm. just make sure that we're still talking about the Title IX policy. Yep. So it would be, say it was a racial, racial epithet or it was discriminatory based on um, gender, national origin, marital status, ancestry, age. Religion. 
so what I'm wondering about is, could this, could, could the policy sort of del be, be clear, clearer in its applicability if we, if we, as has been said, talk about student or school personnel, let's say harassment against or by? Because mm -hmm. then it's this specific policy applying to that specific set of people that all are under the, juris the, the control, the jurisdiction of the, the school division in some sense. Whereas, mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't know if you can do that or not. I worry, I, we probably could. I worry about that and, of course, trying to think of the fringe case that we're going to get in trouble mm -hmm. for overreaching. Say we have a staff member who decides they want to post racially insensitive comments to a third party who's not related to our, um, not a parent, not related to the school, they, the staff member doesn't know anything about them from the school. There are certain things that we could do to address that if it came to the attention of us, if, if um, it was impacting the school day or the instructional day or the ability to get work done to meet the students. But I don't think that this would be the policy to follow. Um, I think that there's other ways to address that. I, I would worry that if we make it larger than that, then we're policing off-campus mm -hmm. speech by our staff, which staff can engage in, and, and we want staff to exercise their First Amendment rights. We hope they would do so respectfully um, and that they wouldn't discriminate against uh, protected classes, but, but we, we can't police, we can, we shouldn't, the board should not be policing that through a policy for off-campus speech. So that would have to be narrowly tailored to yeah. I'm, I'm completely with you, and that's why this, the last part of the sentence is so critical, too. Mm -hmm. By or against students or school personnel at school or any school-sponsored activity. That's what the policy is mm -hmm. already, the language limits it that way. Mm -hmm. I'm, it's a thought I put out yeah. there as an idea. Yeah. Because um, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to, I'm in agreement with the idea that we mm -hmm. want to be very clear about what this, what the applicability is and how to make this, this go. But, mm -hmm. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how to do that. Yeah. And I was trying to think about examples of situations that, that might or might not fall into this. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just said we can't, you know, the school board can't create rights. So I think, you know, again, we can do the best we can. I don't think we should mislead people, but we're 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 subject to our legal constraints so you know our jurisdiction doesn't extend to beyond certain realms so I, I I'm not sure we need to overthink this I mean we should be clear and we, sh we should help people who want to use these policies mm -hmm. but beyond that um, I'm, I'm not sure that we can future proof it so mm -hmm. I don't disagree with Mr. Castillo at all. I think that's right. You know, there's it's very difficult in language to to cover every edge case, mm -hmm. but I think we, based on the language of the policy, is modified by OCR or whoever else got involved. It does feel like there's a little bit of lack of clarity here, okay. um, and in the sense that you know, you can look in different paragraphs and you can think different things are covered in terms of who the harasser is and who the victim is. Mm -hmm. And so I, we could certainly, I think, strive for um, more simplicity and you know, maybe leave you know, the edge cases to the execution of judgment, mm -hmm. sort of go to what Mr. Castillo was saying about not trying to you know, create rights. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, I, I think I could probably, depending on which paragraph I was looking at in which sentence, feel different things about what's covered and what's not. Mm -hmm. And if there's a if there's a way to clarify and narrow it, you know, even if we're if we're ambiguous, we ought to be, you know, this is sort of optional, or you know, the mm -hmm. school board will exercise its judgment. I think a little bit more clarity in that regard would be very helpful. Okay, I will work on drafting that. And I also these are school board policies, so to the extent you have suggestions or ideas or a scenario that we want to work through, give me a call, and we'll, we'll between now and October come up with language, and I can perhaps propose more language or alternative language that the board could review and, and discuss in October. How's that sound? And that sounds fine to me. What, if I sort of, you know, talking about specific cases, I don't want to worry about, you know, contractor harassing contractor completely unrelated to the school. But if, you know, a non-traditional family shows up and 
a teacher or a staff member says, no, 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 you know, you know we're, you know, <laughs> we're a DOMA group here. We, you know, a man and a woman have to show up together and you know, that's it. I, I, that's something that ought to be covered by the policy. And I just want to make sure that we've got the, the breadth of language so that we can have the right procedures and take action in those places where we clearly ought to mm -hmm. without extending or creating rights where they don't exist. And I think we, I do think we kind of get that because it, um, that impacts the student. That gets to harassing the student mm -hmm. because that impacts the student's learning and mm -hmm. ability to attend school and to learn in the division. Mm -hmm. It's tangential, but mm -hmm. I, think if, if could, the, I think we could get there if we, if, if it that's the thing we're hooking, yeah. we ought to be clear about that. Yeah, then. yeah. Okay. I think I, I know my task as far as the language for, for that. And and recognizing that we have three more policies that have this in mind, I will not just limit that addition to this policy. Um, I will make sure that we look at that at the other three as well. Um, page one of policy one. <laughs> Wait, let's just say line one of page one of policy one. Um, Mr. Anderson, I know you had um, had some words, um, some questions about um, this policy that I thought were very, very good. I didn't know if you wanted to, to raise those now. Um, or um, not to wanting to, to stretch the discussion out, um, we, I, I will point out, we, we actually started with sentence two of page one of policy one. Uh, so we got past the first sentence. Um, there were some phrases in here that, that could do, as you're looking at the language in general, to think about um, maybe sort of having this, what does this mean? For instance, mm -hmm. just talking about that first paragraph. Uh, there's a long list of, of protected classes, and I wonder, and, and that list is repeated throughout the document. I wonder if putting that into a, a list and saying this is the list and then referencing that for, for brevity might help because um, the question that when I was reading this, for instance, the first sentence I would read through the whole list, but down to uh, it's line 10. Um, protected by law or based on a belief that such a characteristic exists at school or any school sponsored activity. Um, we've discussed this, it's just for clarity for the other members, and I was puzzled by what does that last sort of 10 or 15 words mean? And it's the, the statement that this is a, you know, characteristic protected by law or based on the belief that a characteristic protected by law applies in this case, mm -hmm. right? So thinking about how to say that, mm -hmm. um, and because that's, that language exists elsewhere in some of the other policies, that was kind of a... Yeah, and, and to just play that out for the benefit of the board, the based on a belief that such characteristic exists, I think could be read different ways, but the way I read that was to say, even if someone doesn't fall into one of these protected classes, if someone is treating them in a way as if believing that they did. So um, discriminating against someone's race without knowing their race or knowing whether they, they would be protected or not, if that conduct or harassment occurs, it's still going to be addressed. Um, but I didn't think that, I agree with Mr. Anderson, that wasn't very clear in this language. And if we defined the protected classes as protected classes, then the language here could say, based on belief that someone falls under these protected classes, whether or not they actually do. Um, seeing nodding in agreement that that would make sense. Okay. And then that change would made, be made throughout here and in the other policies too. Um, another question that had come up is on page three under the complaint procedure. Um, this was something that we did have assistance from outside counsel in working this to propose <coughs> language to OCR. And I think it was a mistake that, that I did not catch. Um, we want to make sure that Complaints of harassment are directed to the compliance officers or to the principals. We will train all of our school administrators, but um, this line there on page three, line um, 29, we will change from building administrator to building principal. If that's all right with you. Okay. Um, Mr. Anderson also had a suggestion that here at 29, um, the three sentences that begin the alleged harassment should be reported as soon as possible. 
of moving that here and in the other policies down to um, the beginning of the next paragraph so that this first sentence says if someone believes they've been harassed they should report it further any student has non knowledge of conduct should report it and school personnel should report it and then the next paragraph talks about when it's reported and that the form should be used so that it's a clear process of you need to report harassment here's the timing for reporting harassment here's the form for reporting reporting harassment so that it's as clear as possible for someone who is pursuing this procedure is that change one that folks would be in that too. Okay. Uh, another uh, point Mr. Anderson raised on page six, beginning at line um, six. The policy states that the school board will take steps to eliminate the hostile environment and may choose to institute other remedial measures. That should be the superintendent shall, because um, at that point it is still in the superintendent's hands to make a determination. So I will make those changes at line six and eight, if that is okay with you all. And I think that was language that was added to the VSBA policy as part of our um, work with OCR. Um, another change in structure would be same page page six line um, 28 that employees can pursue the complaints under the grievance policy as well if, if that's relevant to move that to section five that talks about the alternative complaint procedure um, that's on page eight um, so that it's that didn't make sense to come under appeal that's something that can be separate and apart from someone choosing to pursue this or an employee in this case choosing to pursue a uh, harassment claim. So I would suggest moving that to um, paragraph five, if that's okay with folks. Okay. Um, anything else on policy JFHAGBA? Um, I, I realize that's a lot. I will make sure that in bringing this back in October, I put in red line where those changes were um, I will try to do this as quickly as possible to get you a revised version that you have time to think through um, and kind of t come up with scenarios to walk through of what it might look like because I welcome the talking through this and do have enough experience through representing other divisions of where claims have come up that I've tried to do a lot of that myself but um, anything else on this prohibition against harassment policy JFHA GBA The form that goes along with this is um, we're, we're naming them the same letter name of the policy and then adding it with an F so that it's clear that this form corresponds with the report of harassment. Um, we wanted as much as possible for these harassment report forms to be consistent throughout. Um, one point that, um, that Dr. Noonan made in walking through this that I think is a very good one. While the policy makes clear that retaliation is prohibited, we we wondered if adding that to the form whether it's an asterisk and a footnote or some other way um, that would encourage reporting because we don't in any way want to make this so um, formulaic that somebody wouldn't pursue a claim so if, if someone's not able to understand the full policy or has concerns or is looking at a form and thinks oh gosh this makes it really serious I'm putting my name down and putting down the name of somebody who's who's intimidated me or who's harassed me or who's made me feel uncomfortable by reiterating that on this form that retaliation is prohibited. If that would, would make more people file reports, we'd want that. We're not trying to, to hide behind this being a, a more, uh, by making it a more formal process, we want it to allow people to come forward so that they're in an environment where they are protected. So we could add that um, somehow to this form and to all of the other reports of harassment if that's something the board would like to do. Okay. Thank you. So, so there's one quick Yes. Uh, one of the things I worry a little bit about, does it make sense to have sort of a, a non-complaint specific form? Just. I worry about being intimidating and you know, like mm -hmm. if a student shows up and wants to raise a complaint like well which one it is because mm -hmm. this is form 
XYZ. But if you want form GBFQ, that's over here. So you have to pick and mm -hmm. tell me which one it is so I know which piece of paper to get. That's a, that's a good question. The fact that I'm trying to think of the ways that these forms are different. I think this form is only different from the EEO claim because in that one, it's um, a potential employee. So there's a, an added line for if somebody has applied for a position here but isn't currently an employee. Um, but we could, just as we could move all the policies under one larger policy, I think the form could be the same throughout. In fact, just this one is called report of harassment. One's called report of discrimination. One's called report of discrimination. The third one's sort of complaint of discrimination. So um, maybe they could all be report of harassment slash discrimination. And I, and I don't have a, I'm just wondering whether or not there should be a form for a student. Mm -hmm as opposed to an employee, because that could be more simple. You know, that would not be employment-related discrimination. I'm just, I'm, mm -hmm. all it is I want it to be as approachable as possible, and sure. I don't know what the right answer is. Sure. Mr. Castillo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And in, in that vein, I think asking a student to fill out a form, mm -hmm. I mean, could we have a, a portal, an online link or something that would? That would be helpful. I think, uh, Maybe. I think as students, um, the idea of going to get this form, I mm -hmm. think it would be better to make clear that it is online or that there is an online thing because I think the idea of having to walk into the office and get a form like this can mm -hmm. be kind of daunting for students. And if there was a way that you could just do this in your own home with your parents online, mm -hmm. might be better for students to and more likely for them to report it. Mm -hmm. And in that form, you, you could have a menu that would populate it, I think, more readily. So I, I think that might be something worth exploring. Mm -hmm. Since I butted in, I, I think I also this form, report of harassment, I'd probably say something like report of alleged harassment or possible harassment, which is captured elsewhere, but that's kind of a conclusory term. Mm -hmm. Do you think, since you raised that, it? Would someone who feels harassed want to know that this is, well, you're alleging it or it's possible harassment, but you're not claiming that it is? We could just say complaint mm -hmm. of harassment. Mm -hmm. yeah. I do think as far as having a form, that's something that we can do through our systems. One concern I have with that is, um, how we make sure that it gets to the right person if the complaint needs to what i wouldn't want is a situation where a student who has been harassed files a complaint that then goes to the person who's alleged to have been a harasser so i think we can we can figure out how that goes to to maybe two people in the division so that it's we wouldn't want a situation where something gets ignored or swept under the rug because it gets funneled to somebody who um who is not acting the way we expect them to um so we can figure that out, but that's just one of the things going through my mind of what, how do we make sure we get this right? Um, yeah. And, and again, we welcome this form. Anyone could fill this out and share it, but if we get a complaint, we're, we're asking the principals, the expectation is going to be whoever receives a complaint from a family, from a student, that the principal fills this out. We're not going to not investigate something just because we don't have a form, but this form allows us to document not just do we know what's occurred, alleged to have occurred when, so that we can pull the information that we need and, and thoroughly investigate, and that we share it with the principal or with the compliance officer who's going to investigate and we quickly follow up. But um, there, we will do everything we can to make sure that there's not a time that absence of a form keeps us from looking into a concern that's been raised by someone in our community. And I don't even know this is relevant anymore. And I just really, it just occurred to me, this is actually, oh, this is also used for elementary students, right? Like elementary students can be harassed for their gender or their orient Absolutely. sexual orientation. And like, this is the form that's like really not elementary friendly. I keep thinking of it as like high school student, but obviously yeah. it could be like a nine-year-old. And and um, if a nine-year-old brings that claim, I'm right. guessing it's with a school counselor okay. or with the principal, and they're going and they're to be, be, they're not going to say, going to fill this out. Okay, process. okay, oh, great. That's, yes. I mean, I assume you all are totally on top of that. But just, yeah. That's a good point, though. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for the form, we'll look at the title, we'll look at whether how it's filled out or making sure there's an online version of it too. We'll add in uh, some notation at the top or the bottom making it clear that, that 
harassment or retaliation of any kind is 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 not permitted um and that's important too because we're going to make sure that with the training and with the investigations we everyone who's involved knows that there need to be interim measures put in place because it takes some time to gather the information and to to determine was there um harassment or was this bullying or was this a, a, what was this but in that interim of making that determination there needs to be support in place for everyone involved so um that piece of non-retaliation i think would allow that discussion to come up when the compliance officer or the principal or the counselor whoever's taking the form has the discussion with the person who has been harassed or is alleged to have been harassed okay that's one policy and one form down um next um gb um this is the equal employment opportunity non-discrimination policy um, this is similar to the last policy. Um, it does have a different compliance officer. Complaints would be filed um, with the director of HR. In this case, it's, it's Amy Hall. But we've written the policies to be a generic um, email address and a generic title, or not a generic, but a, a title and an email, a corresponding email that relates to the title rather than a specific person. So as there are employee changes or if, if the Title IX coordinator or others change, we don't the board doesn't need to go back and amend the policy um so for this and the remainder of the policies i did put in red those areas where um we added language to the virginia school board policy this virginia school board policy did include gender identity as a protected class miss ewing shared that that's because this policy was amended by her more recently in light of the um, gloucester cases um so i i think that certainly should stay um as it is I didn't know if there were any questions from um, the board about this policy. Um, I'm trying to go back also to Mr. Anderson to your notes. Um, yes. uh, the, the change that Mr. Anderson proposed to the last policy of when the report of discrimination should be made, I, I do think it makes sense to move that from lines 37 down to the top of um, the next paragraph that talks about use of the form. Um, and the section that employees can pursue these complaints um, through the grievance procedure would then also be moved to the right to alternative complaint procedure on page five. Um, and it, on this and the other policies, while we've added in the principals at the buildings as being alternate compliance officers, I realize um, Mary Beth Connolly actually pointed out that we put principal of Jesse Thackeray Preschool, whereas that should be administrator. Um, so I will make that change throughout if that's all okay with you all any questions on on this policy mr castillo just one little bit do we have a standing equal opportunity non-discrimination committee that's kind of i don't think we do i right? don't think we do so should we just take that out saying if we have a standing committee Page three, line nine. Isn't it nice to have the line numbers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So say if the complaint you, you alleges the superintendent has violated its policy, <laughs> um, at its next scheduled meeting, the school board shall appoint a standing committee. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're just we're an ad hoc committee, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, I can make that change. Thank you. And I know Dr. Noonan will do everything in his power to make sure that that doesn't happen, so that there's no complaint against him. Anything else on, on policy GB? All right, I um, realized that I made my changes to the version that Greg gave me, so I'm going to make a note of that. Okay. Form GB, um, the report of discrimination, I think report makes sense. I'll add the retaliation note. Um, do we want to make this uh, similar? Complaint of discrimination versus report mm -hmm. of discrimination, so it's not... Yeah. That sounds good. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And this is the form, as I mentioned, that has a little bit more information because it talks about the position applied for, the position that they didn't get. And this would apply, um, I feel like I'm glossing through this too fast, and it's a very important policy. I want to make sure it's clear that we don't um, allow discrimination against current employees in their retaining, maintaining employment in um, seeking um, raises or changes of positions or in someone who's applying to the division for the first time who does, isn't currently employed. Um, is what this EEO policy covers. Okay. Next policy is JB. This is the equal educational opportunity. So this is J is the student section of the policies. Um, the red line ver or the version that I gave you does show the changes to the VSBA model policy um, and adds in principles as um, compliance officers I do think that uh, Mr. Anderson's changes of the timing for reporting should be moved down. Um, and I don't think there was anything else in this policy that I needed to bring to your attention, but welcome any questions. Any questions? And there. the corresponding form calling it a complaint. Um, One question. Mr. So the policy statement, thank you, Mr. Chair, on, on, on line seven mm -hmm. is then followed by something on line 12. It says basis of sex or gender. Mm -hmm. It's much more limited. It is. So, and that's intentional. It, that is intentional. And um, the, the reason for that, and I think we could include sexual orientation on line 12. Right now, based on the VHSL policies, we cannot say that someone based on their gender identity will not be denied equal access to sports because we have to follow what VHSL um, requires for, for athletes to participate on certain teams. Um, so that is intentionally not the, the full um, category that are, that are above. Yeah, I think it makes sense to put sexual orientation. Okay. I think that is too, and that was something that Mr. Um, Anderson raised earlier, so I appreciate you bringing that up. Is that the board in agreement on that? All right. Anything else on policy, JB? Is it hot in here? Yes. Yeah, I'll turn it down. Okay. I'm roasting. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> as it gets warmer, I talk faster. So. I was going to say, it's really not freezing. Oh, oh my God, it's okay. great. <laughs> you poor ladies over here are probably feeling me radiating. Um, I think Mr. Anderson, be careful. So your comment about VHSL leads to the thought something I would just put out to my colleagues about whether or not we would like to at some point have a conversation about perhaps urging VS and VHSL to uh, revisit some of those thoughts, um, whether or not gender identity is something that they could consider. I put this out there as an idea. We could talk about that later. And, and now I feel like we're moving too quickly through these. So as you look at these or think of about these and we, I get to the revised versions, let me know if you have questions, concerns, issues, and we'll, we'll tackle them. Um, JBA is the Section 504 non-discrimination policy and grievance procedures. This is different than the other process as required under the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 um, that does allow the 45 school days um, from the date of the alleged discrimination. Um, Mr. Anderson had suggested moving that to the top of the paragraph from line um, 30 to the top of the next paragraph um, within the formal complaint procedure, um, which I do think makes sense. But um, this policy, unlike the others, this would be reported to Rebecca Sharp as the Director of Student Services and the um, Director of Special Education. Um, another thing, that, another suggestion that came up, um, sorry, I keep using names so much tonight, but Mr. Anderson had talked about um, lines five and six of page two. Um, this was a addition to the VSBA policy suggested by Dr. Noonan um, that if anyone wanted to remain anonymous, there's the reminder that we are not going to allow retaliation. So 
if someone does choose to remain anonymous, it limits the ability to fully investigate because you can't share, it's alleged you said to this person on this day. So you have to go about it in a much more roundabout way. And sometimes you can't gather all the information to be able to make a finding. So um, Dr. Noonan's, I think very good point was by reminding that later in the policy, retaliation is prohibited by putting that here, perhaps someone who, who reads and says, oh wow, it, I won't be anonymous, might then be more likely to to share the concerns so that we can fully investigate. So um, one suggestion would be to add similar language where anonymity is discussed in other policies, a similar parenthetical or notation that retaliation is prohibited, just as we would add that to the forms. How do you all feel about that? Go with that. I say advise in writing. Sorry, in say writing, that. advise in writing. Was advised in writing? Advi would be advised in writing. So I, would, I, would, I think that's good to spread it around, but I think it would be good to tell to make sure it's written. I'm not sure I'm clear so on... So anonymous yeah. will be advised in writing with such confidentiality. Got it. Right. Thank you. Okay. And that would be easy enough to do because the the handbook that we're putting together, the inside baseball of what a complaint will look like and how it will be investigated will include a letter to the complainant of this is what, what you've alleged, this is what we're going to do. We, we don't allow retaliation. If you have concerns, here's who you talk to. So we can make sure that that's included in that form letter that will be going out. So absolutely, yes. I think that's a good addition. Um, Mr. Anderson had also had um, proposed changes to paragraph two, starting at lines 10 of page two, about um, talking through the structure of once a complaint is received, if the um, compliance officer believes more than 15 days are required to investigate, moving that um, up into the section so that it kind of follows the natural timeline of the complaints received. If it looks like it's going to take longer, there will be notification in writing, and then talking about the timing for um, the conclusion, um, the notice letters, and the interim measures. So we can play around at that, and I can put it in red line of what those changes are. But um, I, I do think that it makes sense to put this in as clear a, a way that we can so someone knows if they file a complaint, this is what's going to be happening next. But I'll have to put that kind of in a red line version to show you how it's not changing any of the, the language, but it's changing the order of the language so that hopefully it would be more clear for somebody of what to expect going forward. So I don't feel like I explained that that well, but I, I will make sure that I put it in red line so that you can follow what changes have been made. Um, Mr. Castillo. Just, just, I think this come up before, but school days in the summer or mm -hmm. vacations. Um, I, I, we, I think we dealt with that, but it's just well, yeah. school days just means... School days we, would be business days, business so days. July 4th wouldn't count, but otherwise every day that central office is open is considered a school day, yeah. Okay. Policy JBA has a similar form that goes along with it, and this one is called Complaint of Discrimination, so um, that's consistent with the other drafts, and we would add the retaliation language okay now we're into the um, a policies these are the school board um, um, policies that are, are more um, aspirational of, of what what it is the school board expects of, of the um, division I'm trying to think what they their foundation the VSBA characterizes them of foundations and basic commitments of the board um, so AE, um, this hues closely to our previous policy A1. Um, so our policy A1 or I1 um, had much of our goals. Um, one thing that that policy had, and forgive me as I'm sorting through my notes, I believe, yes, that was a policy drafted in 2006 called Mission Statement, Values Statement, Strategic Plan Goals and Objectives for 2006 to 2012. So that window of time has passed. Um, so these policies we're proposing to break that out into two policies, one being AE, which is a school division goals and objectives, and one being AD, which is the educational philosophy of the school board. Um, 
both Mr. Castillo and Mr. Anderson raised some concerns with policy AE, so I did, I, I um, soul crushingly vague might have been used. Um, I did reach out to Ms. Ewing of the VSB and heard back from her uh, shortly before the meeting saying that a vast majority of this policy was what she adopted when she came on and she didn't feel like she was in a position to take away that a school board's committed to excellence in <coughs> education, but certainly that language isn't required by the code. Um, the section that is required is the standards of quality objectives and the standards of qualities for programs and services that are at lines 28 through 42. Um, so this is the school board's opportunity if it wants to use this to, um, to say what the school division is committed to. Um, and Greg, I think there are some pieces here that you had wanted to raise for about that kind of general <laughs> provision, if you want to, or I can, however you'd like to. <laughs> Thanks. Um, there, were, there were, so yeah, there were a couple of items in here um, that made me wonder a little bit about um, kind of what what was actually meant by the language. And now having that origin story helps a little bit to, mm -hmm. to help with it. Lines 15 and 16, for example, um, it, it wasn't clear to me what, we, what it would have meant to say, um, you know, introduces each student to a variety of interests and subject areas that offer exposure to the range of opportunities available in later years. Does that mean we're uh, opening the eyes of fifth graders to what they might be able to do in 11th grade? Or does that mean we're opening the eyes of students to what they might be when they're 50, um, you know, sort of what is the, what does that mean? And I, I don't know, that was a, that was a question that, that struck me. Um, further down, there was, uh, there's a, a single word in line 25 that made me kind of um, puzzled, but the whole, the whole last <laughs> sentence of the third paragraph, <laughs> safety, <Appearance>. physical <laughs> comfort and appearance, also a vital environmental component. <laughs> Literally my note, back said, of what? <laughs> because I couldn't figure out what that meant. Is it the way the buildings look? Is it the way the landscape looks? Is it you know something else entirely? The I teacher's hair. No yeah. um, is it the color of the textbooks? Uh, the mm -hmm. fact that laptops have to have cases? I don't know what that meant. So I was puzzled by that one. And then finally, the, the sentence on line 23 and 24 about a responsive environment, including competent, dedicated teachers using a variety of techniques in a classroom atmosphere where students can function and so on. Um, does that mean that the teachers are using a classroom atmosphere, or does that mean that a responsive environment has two components, one of which is competent, dedicated teachers, and one of which is a classroom atmosphere? And mm -hmm. so to me, the fact that in those three sentences, I just kind of was puzzled by what we were after. Thank you again. The, or the origin of this really helps. Yeah. Um, and I guess I will, I will uh, note, I'm glad that my uh, <laughs> colleague, Mr. Castillo, had a similar sort of set of reactions to this. Thank you. So this is not legally required. This is your language to play with. And I, yes, um, whether the IV language or the mission statement is put in here um, is something that you all can decide. I welcome your desires for this. Folks have opinions and thoughts about this. I think it's uh, a great opportunity between now and second read to uh, think about it and share those with Ms. Minson so that we can craft the policy that works best for for us versus the very uh, what was the term you used? Soul crushingly vague. Yeah. Soul crushingly. Can I can I ask that? <laughs> I, I want to um, just say, <laughs> when we when we looked at this, we we were sort of gutted as well, um, and thought um, it was easier not to touch it and just kind of let you guys figure out what you wanted to do with it. Um, so, if uh, you have some ideas of where you'd like to go, and I saw. Mr. Castillo hold up the placemat sort of speaks to who we are and what we're about. Um, if you'll let myself and Ms. Minson know, we can we can take a stab at, and, and Ms. High and I can take a stab at crafting some language that might speak a little bit more to generally, <laughs> A, generally, um, which by the way is sort of an interesting heading because it doesn't mean all the time, it just means sort of generally <laughs> speaking. Um, 
That's true. Take a look at how we're operating. Ms. Russell? I, was just, I think that's a good idea because I think one of the things that stands out to me as this policy is written is we're not really in it to win it. Like we're just kind of putting it out there to check that box. And so I think if we really want to put some muscle behind our policies, then we have to reflect what we're saying with our other assorted, like the placement. So. It, does, uh, it, it does suggest that this policy would need to be updated more frequently than other policies because this one in particular would potentially change from year to year. Mm -hmm. um, but specifically around goals and objectives, but. Mm -hmm. Mr. Castillo, and then Mr. Ryan. Yeah. I mean, I think in all seriousness, this, this policy makes policies look bad because um, it's so vacuous. And maybe we just say we want to be the premier IB school division and, and, and leave it at that. And that way we don't have to update it. We just have to keep doing it every year. But, but you know, it's, it's right up there with an airline having as its policy, you know, we don't want to have fatal crashes. I mean, it's just so, it, it's just it, save the ink and the paper. So, <laughs> so if we're going to do this, let's do it right. But I, I think just having policies for their own sake is, is just terrible. Yeah, it feels like a nothing, I don't even know what we have. It. It's like we already have a mission, a mission statement, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't even know why this exists. So unless there's some legal reason why we need to have certain language in here it is just a place for yeah other than the standards of quality objectives and programs and services that hold general there's nothing in that that is legally required that's the you all to choose what it is you want to do with it mr ivinger so i think i'm just going to repeat what mr castillo said it ought to be it ought to match exactly to what's on the place map it ought to align perfectly it says i don't think we need to be you know, I'll step away completely from the UI enrollment take. I don't think we care what the SBA says here because this is our goals and objectives. Mm -hmm. We ought to have consistent messaging and it ought to be at the level that doesn't need to be changed every year. So these are the sort of goals that you know you might look at every decade. And we just ought to put down what our first principles are, or first principle even, as clearly and directly as we can. And if a future board doesn't want to do that, then they can change it. But this is what, it, it's an enduring document. I'm actually, I actually agree with that. It's, it's, this is one that I think we can, let's do it right, but let's make sure it's kind of holds to our values versus the genericness of what's there. Mm -hmm. yeah. You got a mark on <laughs> And can I just ask a question on line 34 about reporting compliance with the standards of quality? Is that something we do annually? It is. Okay, mm -hmm. something you guys... Okay. <laughs> All right. Anything else on policy AE? Moving on to policy AD. This is the other policy that would replace IA. So IA is being broken down into AE and AD. Um, this um, is a pretty generic policy too. Um, and um, feedback I got on this, um, line seven, ensure, instead of ensuring that each student be equipped, but each student is equipped to communicate effectively. Not, I think that's a reasonable word choice change. Also, um, with the, the work that we've been doing with um, IB, it's not just about preparing a student for work in higher education, there's also preparing a student for life. So. Um, Mr. Anderson had raised, does it make sense to um, look at the IB um, character traits and have some of that included in here since our educational philosophy does follow the IB model? Um, I, I actually think we ought to take a stab at this uh, first paragraph as well as the previous policy mm -hmm. um, and sort of align them. I'm not sure that the bullets below necessarily change tremendously, but the, at least the first paragraph that incorporates what are the elements of an IB school division that we aspire to be mm -hmm. would fit nicely into this um, first piece. Mm -hmm. One um, one part of the bullets below that I, I do think um, makes sense to consider changing 
Um, right now it says the school board, the final bullet, allocates and uses assets fairly and efficiently. School board allocates assets and can oversee the use, but the school board isn't using the assets. So um, I guess proposed language there, uh, thank you, Mr. Anderson, would be allocate and oversees the use um, of assets to ensure assets are used fairly or efficiently. I, we can make that be less. I, I would say equitably as opposed to fairly, mm -hmm. just as a point of Mr. Ridinger, just a quick note that I, you know, apropos of what we said on the last policy, mm -hmm. I don't feel wedded to any of the language here. Okay. Even the bullets are all just repetitive of elsewhere. So this says, what's our educational philosophy? To the extent that that's something different than goals and objectives, then let's put down what our educational philosophy is and not worry about, you know, there's no need to stick to um, VSBA form mm -hmm. language where it's not legally required mm -hmm. and it's just, you know, godly good. Yeah, especially if we don't like it. Yep. Mr. Castillo, I'll just pile on it. I, I think, I think Mr. Reitinger is right. I think the educational philosophy should be the leading document. Mm -hmm. And you probably can have as part of that document our goals and objectives. But I, I think the way it's now, it's, it's kind of just a dog's breakfast of stuff. So I, I just mash them up and, and do, do it all in one document. Mm -hmm. And also, what's the difference between our educational philosophy and our mission and then our vision? It's like we have like a lot of terms. Mm -hmm. Like, can we just say our, like our mission and vision statement? Like, I don't I'm just confused because it, it seems like we're, we're using different words in here than we use elsewhere. So then it's like, well, you've got a mission statement and a vision mm -hmm. and you've got the the placemat and you've got your goals and then you've got some philosophy mm -hmm. um it's kind of all the same thing mm -hmm. um simplify because i think we have great mission and vision and the placement is, is wonderful and i think it's you've already done the work so we just do it once Narrative. just put it one time yeah <laughs> that's what i'm hearing kind of go with the one mm -hmm. and just Kind of build that around what we have out there versus two individuals yep. yeah instead of the two for ad ae yeah, it's just mm -hmm. yeah. thumbs up all around okay yes. sounds good anything else on ad <laughs> <Just>. yeah <laughs> all right policy aa school division legal status this is one um for which there's no corresponding um wait is aa one on our list for today mm -hmm. that might be the one it is okay yeah. um there's no corresponding um, policy that we have. Um, the board already adopted BB, which I need to look over here to see. Um, that is the school board legal status. Um, and I think if we adopt a, if the board were to adopt AA at the same time it adopts the others, AD, AE, um, the AC if we go there. Um, then we will have a complete set of Section A, the foundations and basic commitments from the VSBA model policies. Um, and everything from our Section 1 foundation policies will have been replaced. So that feels big to me in looking at this policy overhaul process. Um, don't know if you have any questions about this policy AA school division legal status. This is from the code and from article um, Eight of the Constitution of Virginia. So I do think that this is a policy to keep in there, but um, welcome questions on this. One thing that I do think we should do is capitalize standards of quality since that's a defined term used by the Board of Education. So we'll, we'll make that change. Um, and Mr. Anderson has suggested adding in the Falls Church City as vested in the Falls Church City School Board, which I think does make it a little bit more clear. Mr. Yeah. yeah, just a, a, a overall thing. We, we can't get our name straight in these documents. Sometimes we call ourselves the Falls Church City Public Schools Board, but it's interesting how it just just look around from time to time. And I, I don't don't know that, and, and I'm not. That's not a dig on you, Ms. Minson. I think we just it kind of varies from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, I think the first I think the first sentence is absolutely. Totally vital. I don't know that we have to have as a policy what the general, well, okay, the general assembly requirement, but a lot of this stuff just starts to rehash how the 
system works and doesn't have anything to do with us. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not really our policy uh, about a, a lot of these things. It's just the way it is. So. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's helpful for someone who would be, a, I'm not sure who it is, maybe other than me, that decides it's fun to read through policies and wonder how things are structured. But I'm, I'm thinking who would be reading about the school division legal status um, other than a parent or attorney trying to sue the school division but it does break down that this is where the authority comes from this is how schools are divided out um, I think you're right it's how it is the board is created and yeah mm -hmm. I don't feel strongly about this one I, I in this one deep disagree strongly with mr. Castillo in that I believe the last sentence which is the thing that I think is operative and the rest of it's just a history lesson mm -hmm. in describing what the code says but it's not it's completely not harmful so I mm -hmm. really don't care. Okay. Moving on. Policy AC um, and this relates to the other um, policies the, the first kind of meteor policies that we talked about but because this falls in the school board's kind of foundational policies this is the the board saying we're committed to non-discrimination um, and this shall prevail in our policies and in our practices it's it's very very broad it's the other policies that talk about what that looks like and how that works um, but I, I I think this is language that other than adding the protected classes that the board has wanted to add I think that this is the VSBA got it right of, of, and this it should be structured this simply um, in in the foundational policies of the board but welcome questions or or additions too questions or comments from anyone so Ms. Russell just out of Here. If you do your mic. Mm -hmm. What is policy A B? Because clearly, if you're looking at this, like these are, you know, A A A B A C D. These are the introductory policies, and obviously, mm -hmm. I think they're the overarching ones. So when you look at them in context that way, so I'm just curious, you know, if you were, if you were looking at actual physical manual, these would be here, you know, at the top. And so I'm just curious for my own I don't think there is an A B. I'm just curious. Yep, just there, like, there I mean, is. A, but I mean, if it had like an old school, you know, hard copy manual, mm -hmm. that would be the and, front of your manual, these A, B, A, A. And I do have that in my office. It's yay big. Yes. Um, there is no, I can't, I'm going back through my notes here. There is no A, B. And that will be the same throughout the VSBA model policies. It could be that in the past there was an A, B, and that's been removed or incorporated into others. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any other comments? If not, uh, let me just say <laughs> um, thank you all. Thank to both of you and Dr. Nina for the, the review of this. Uh, a couple of these are in particular things that I had been asking about for a little bit um, of just kind of getting us in line with that. But little did I know that so many of us on the board had strong feelings about some of these different things that have brought up great conversation tonight and I think uh, will make these policies better and stronger for for us as a community and I definitely appreciate the, uh, the hard work and time that, that you all have put into this and the sounds like continued hard work that you'll continue to put into some of these policies um, for when they come back to us in October for final approval. But I do sincerely appreciate it. With that, if uh, I can entertain a motion for for first reading. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I move that the school board approve the first reading of policies JFHAGBA, prohibition against harassment and retaliation in corresponding form JFHAGBAF, prohibition against harassment and retaliation. GB, Equal Employment Opportunity Non-Discrimination in Corresponding Form, GBF, 
Report of Discrimination, JB Equal Education Opportunities Non-Discrimination in Corresponding Form, JBF. Report of Discrimination, JBA, Section 504, Non-Discrimination Policy and Grievance Procedures in Corresponding Form, JBAF. Section 504, Non-Discrimination Policy and Grievance Procedures. AE, School Division Goals and Objectives. AD, Educational Philosophy. AA, School Division Legal Status. And AC, Non-Discrimination with the feedback as provided by the school board. Thank you, Mr. Rankin. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Castillo. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Can we, can we ask a follow-up question? You most certainly can. Um, at, at one point, Ms. Minson discussed sort of potentially consolidating all of these policies into one large harassment policy. Uh, would, would you all prefer to, to do it that way, or would you prefer them to be broken out individually? Or would you like us to present it both ways? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, in that part, no. Uh, in, and I was going to say I kind of feel that way as well, but we'll com defer to the majority of the board. Uh, we'll, other opinions? I defer to the drafter as you go through. I think you'll see whether it's clearer or as a consolidated policy. The the one thing I'm thinking about in consolidating them is is it too much of a choose your own adventure? That if you have this complaint, we're going to it's still going to be the investigation procedure. There still will be the appeal procedure, but certain complaints will be with with this time frame or. If it's okay, let us let us go back and. and so it's going to say we'll if that's the case, we'll yeah. Explore it. Yeah, yeah. Wh whichever you okay. way that you all kind of decide on to uh, that's going to be best best policy. I uh, move forward with that way. That's fine, okay. Mr. Castillo. Yeah, and, and you know, it almost seems to me you could have you could do it either way, where you have them all consolidated and then just a prefatory kind of roadmap of their. There are all these possibilities, and, and here's where you go to look at them, or you could mm -hmm. keep them separate and just have an introductory policy saying, mm -hmm. well, we, we, mm, we, don't like, yeah. we don't like, we don't like, we're against harassment of any form. Mm -hmm. The following policies are uh, address these, and then they could just go and refer to it each one. Mm -hmm. So, but up to you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next, um, are there any um, member have any future agenda items they'd like to to bring up for discussion? Mr. Castillo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wondering, have have I know we are talking about having a dinner with the city council coming up soon. Internally, for our purposes as a body, are we having any kind of retreat? Gathering, meeting. I think there's some things worth talking about. I just don't know, given that we're in September, how we can productively do it. And we've talked. I, 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 we we have talked about it, and I guess it may have dropped off the radar a little bit. And particularly trying to think of that kind of joint meeting as we start to prepare for budgetary wise, but I'm open to sitting out with the superintendent and kind of seeing if there's a possibility of us going, because you're right, there are probably some topics that internally that we could, that serve some discussion and attention on our side internally that we could potentially, so I'll, okay. I'll, I'll work with Dr. Newman and see if there's a possibility of us being able to, oh, to work towards that. <coughs> Anyone else? If not, we'll move on to the report from the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a few topics this evening that I want to just sort of touch on uh, and then invite questions if you have them. Um, the first is, as I think everybody is aware, um, Rushmark and HIT 
Corporation have um, put together an unsolicited PPEA uh, plan for the Virginia Tech, University of Virginia site. And there have been some questions about what does that mean potentially to us as a school division with the um, work that we're doing with our 10 acre or with, with the city's 10 acres, general government's 10 acre site and our school site. Um, and all I can really share with you from a, a strategic standpoint is sort of how I, how I think we are starting to see it as a, a positive um, opportunity. Um, so as you may recall, um, Virginia and Virginia Tech have uh, this ground lease with an option to buy um, the site 20, uh, 2020, 2021. Um, so first of all, nothing likely is gonna happen with the proposal until there is this opportunity to purchase the site. Um, but what I think is um, unique to um, this unsolicited proposal is that um, it has sort of spurred into action some other comprehensive plan amendments on the county side. Um, so it's my understanding that um, that John Faust, who is um, the Board of Supervisors for this region, will be carrying a comp plan amendment to zone um, the Virginia, Virginia Tech site um, to be the same as the WMATA site, which then ultimately consolidates that site into zoning types that are similar. Um, that, that comp plan amendment mirrors what's happening on potentially the 10 acre site at our um, on, at our place as well which then creates sort of a contiguous um, flow I think that there are some opportunities there for a number of reasons one is uh, with respect to um, potential needs for a signalized intersection for example along route 7 and being able to get through to the other properties, it creates uh, more of a, a greater need on all parties um, to, to have that. Um, I think it creates an opportunity because we uh, pretty clearly will be the first out with um, our site development. Uh, if things go as planned with the 10 acre site, um, we will be um, shovels in the ground in 2023, I think is the right, 2021, sorry. 2021, um, and it's pretty evident that not much will happen with that Virginia, Virginia Tech site for a number of years, um, and uh, and and some other some other potential pos <coughs> positives can come from that as well. Uh, for example, if Virginia, Virginia Tech is expanding their footprint with respect to instructional programming and and the like, it gives us an opportunity to kind of see where they're headed so that we can potentially begin to mirror and map some of their programs as well. So it kind of creates more of a dovetail uh, approach to that. So, um, you, you know, I, one of the things I don't know much about is um, sort of logistically how it's all gonna flow um, with the Virginia Tech, Virginia site and with WMATA. So all I can really sort of opine about truly is what our opportunity is on the 10 acre site and where we are with our new high school building, but I think if you were to um, ask myself or the city manager, Shield, sort of what our overall perspective was of that uh, PPEA unsolicited approach coming forward, I think it's a net positive for us uh, as a school system and potentially as uh, the 10 acre site as well. What's interesting or um, what an outcome was of that unsolicited PPEA is that Virginia Tech and Virginia had to go out with a 45 day um, solicitation essentially for other folks that wanted to get involved and it's no secret that Rushmark and HIT are one of the two finalists for the 10 acre site too so for them to come in behind now and drop this um, I think was strategic on their part um, and, and we know that EYA is the other and don't know what EYA will do they may engage in the process of that PPEA solicitation they may not um, but um, that remains to be seen, but it is out for a 45 day PPEA solicitation at this point. So um, I know there's a lot of questions that go with that. I don't have a lot of answers to the questions, but I, that's sort of what I know at this point um, is that on balance, I think most people are seeing it as, as a positive. Um, 
I don't know if there are questions that you want to follow up with on that that I might be able to answer. <coughs> Ms. Layton? Just curious if there anybody has any had any kind of conversation with Virginia Tech kind of on their big picture vision. Do they want to expand on that yeah. side or they want to get out of it? Kind of where are they big picture on it's that a good, side? It's a good good question. Um, we first of all we have had some high level conversations with Virginia Tech. Um, about six months ago, I, I guess it was probably six months ago, Wyatt Shields, myself, Mayor Tarter had a meeting with the um, head of their capital planning um, and, and building program. And he, he shared with us that they are really trying to do some consolidation in Northern Virginia to really sort of take, take some of the market up here for um, academic programs at the post-secondary level. I don't I know at the time that they were talking about engaging in programs such as cybersecurity, biomedical research, um, STEM, STEAM, those kinds of things, and potentially growing the footprint on that particular site, and also potentially think about doing some um, residential also. So, you know, whether it's dorms or, you know, internship programs and things like that because of the proximity to um, downtown. Um, so I, I think that they have some interest in expanding up here. Um, I think what also remains to be seen is what's Virginia's role going to be in that, University of Virginia, because there is some question whether they'll stay on that site or whether Virginia Tech will break off and they'll have the site. And Virginia is thinking, I, I've heard, that I've heard, I don't know that this is true, uh, but they are thinking about um, consolidating some of their services over to Maryfield on the old ExxonMobil site and kind of joining up with Inova Fairfax and looking at medical programs more specifically. So I, I think there is some interest in consolidating some of their Northern Virginia services, and that is a pretty nice site to be able to do it on. Any other questions? All right. Uh, second thing is uh, there has been some ongoing conversation um, over the course of the last, I don't know, couple of months, I guess, about recess at the elementary school. And we came forward and shared with you recently um, sort of where we were with that. Um, I also wanted to um, bring forward to you a regulation that we have put in place that uh, is consistent with the changes in the um, state uh, requirement of, or state allowance of recess. And so we adopted, um, we internally, a regulation is obviously a superintendent's regulation, uh, but it is part of policy IGAE, which is an in instructional regulation, uh, instructional policy, a regulation about recess. And I, I just wanted to read it to you so that you knew kind of what we were, um, the intention and spirit behind the recess reg. Daily recess of, of at least 30 minutes is required at the elementary school level on full school days. School staff should encourage students to participate in student-selected structured or unstructured play and to engage in moderate to vigorous physical activity. Recess can be split into two blocks. Outdoor recess is preferred. The building principal or his, his or her designee has discretion over the time and location of recess. Recess is mandatory for all elementary students and may not be withheld uh, from an individual student or group of students as punishment or to conduct academic or extra or or um, academic or extracurricular activities an exception to this expectation is permitted only when a child commits a disciplinary infraction during recess and the logical consequence would be temporary suspension of recess for that student at the time of the infraction so um, we have provided that to our elementary principals there is uh, at least 30 minutes of recess, as we indicated at the last meeting at uh, both uh, Mount Daniel and at Thomas Jefferson, but we did want to put a regulation in place that spoke to that because um, I thought that, that, was, that was important as well. So I wanted to put that out there for you. Any questions for that one? And we are still planning to have <coughs> the elementary school principals just to give an update in October about yep. uh, how it's been going. So so far. Yep. All right. We have, uh, we have, it was funny. I just as an anecdote, I was at Mount Daniel today and one of the paraprofessionals came in and said, I know we've extended recess to uh, 35 minutes, but it sure doesn't feel like it. <laughs> he was tired. So anyway, um, Ms. Ru Ms. Russell. If at all possible, 
possible at some future point whenever if there's a way to slip in an item into the morning announcements just notifying parents that we put this policy in place i think that that would be appreciated too i mean again at any yep. point in time but i think that that's one of the things that the community has asked a lot about mm -hmm. and so i think that they would appreciate knowing that there's actual policy that's been put in place regulation just regulation. Just, just for clarity yeah, but yeah okay. absolutely we can for sure um, the next item that I had for Superintendent's Matters was um, uh, September is Suicide um, Prevention Month. Um, obviously, um, suicide is something that we um, take very seriously and are concerned about with our students. Um, and we are working with our students throughout the year. So it's not just in September. Throughout the year, we put in a number of things uh, to work with our students. And I wanted just to sort of highlight a couple of things to make sure that the board was aware and the community was aware. Um, so for example, each of our schools has a crisis, crisis response team. So in, in the event that there is an incident, a uh, crisis response team is deployed uh, to work with students. Um, and if, uh, if the need be, we have access to outside resources uh, and support. Um, we have a student services team that provides training on threat assessments uh, every year. So that's what to look for in case of some concern in a student. Um, we provide online training through our, our safe schools process, um, which is the, the online uh, approach around particularly suicide prevention. Um, through our parent university, we offer parents an opportunity for some trainings. Um, those go through Fairfax County, but we do offer those through our parent university. Um, our student services staff are trained in cognitive behavioral therapy, so uh, it does provide us an opportunity to work with students that may be having some mental health issues uh, in advance. Um, during the summer, our social worker, psychologist, and behavior specialists also attend the Virginia Department of Education's um, State Mental Health Conference, and there they're trained in trauma-informed care, trauma-informed um, instruction, and also suicide prevention. Um, uh, we also do a lot with our social emotional workshops and our, our groups that we work with. Our school counselors do that along with our behavioral specialists. Uh, and lastly, we do partner with Crisis Link, and some of you might be familiar with um, Crisis Link, uh, but we, we partner with Fairfax uh, through our Falls Church Community Services Board for Crisis Link, which provides um, an opportunity for students to text or to phone a 24 7 access line. Uh, in case they are in need of um, some support or are in crisis. Uh, and then there's also the National Suicide Prevention Line that offers services both in Spanish and in English. Uh, and then through each of those, there's a chat line that's available. So we are trying to provide as many resources as we possibly can to students um, and make, the, make students aware of those. Uh, picking up on something that uh, Ms. Gill mentioned earlier, particularly about the harassment, some of the uh, work that we're planning to do this year is to get this information in front of kids in the bathrooms um, so that it's super clear. Here's, if, if you have a crisis, here's who, here's who you can call. Um, and so that will be part of our, part of our planning process this year as well. Um, but obviously, um, not obviously maybe, but it is some, suicide prevention is something that we do take. Uh, very seriously in, here in the city of Falls Church and I wanted to make sure that you knew uh, as well as the community some of the things that we are that we're doing behind the scenes to make sure that our students are safe lastly you know um, the idea of building relationships with our students and with our family um, one of the perhaps one of the most um, one of the most precious opportunities I think we have as a school division is that we're small and that we have an opportunity to know our families and our families know us. And so in the case of a crisis, uh, our families are more inclined to pick up the phone and talk to someone in our schools than maybe in a, a larger school system. Or a, st or a student who may be in crisis is more likely to go to a teacher because that teacher has that opportunity to know a student very differently. Or maybe it's another adult in the building that they may not have as a teacher, but they're significant enough to be able to go to them. Um, and it may be a coach, it may be a certified athletic trainer, it may be a paraprofessional, but we, we do know our students in ways here differently than any school division that I've ever had an opportunity to work with. And uh, I think that that positions us well to be able to engage students and intervene early um, when we see something that isn't quite right. So I um, wanted to share that. Uh, and then lastly, um, 
Hurricane Florence. Um, we are um, monitoring Hurricane Florence very closely. Um, the only impact so far of Hurricane Florence is the um, cancellation of the tailgate at the high school. We are looking at potentially moving the football game from Friday night uh, to maybe Thursday. Um, but it would be early Thursday because Thursday is the Mary Ellen Henderson back to school night and parking is at a premium on that site. So we are working closely with um, the uh, school division that we would be playing, which is Nelson County, to potentially have a 3.30 start so that we could have a 3.30 game. Um, students could go. Uh, we would encourage, and this is just a working plan at the moment. This is not, this is not set in motion. I'm just sort of giving you a heads up. Um, what we would do is we would encourage parents that would be coming in case there was a delay in the game to park at the Virginia Tech Virginia um, site. And if they shared their parking ticket that they paid for parking at that site, that would be their entry ticket to the football game. So that that would then sort of segregate the parking from uh, the school site so that when we did get to back to school night, it wouldn't impact uh, impact. That does have um, some negative consequences for our athletic program because it does take away money from our gate receipts that we earn. Um, but if it's, if it's pouring down rain on Thursday and we're playing anyway, the gate may be impacted. Um, so, so we're kind of watching that. Um, and in terms of the dance on Saturday night, um, a decision will be made probably um, tomorrow or Thursday about that. Um, we're continuing to monitor sort of the, the track of the system and potential impacts. We are preparing our buildings, clearing out gutters, making sure all of the downspouts are taken care of, making sure all the stormwater management drains are taken care of. Um, and we have uh, our crews are going to be on call in case of emergency. I think our greatest concern at this point, frankly, is the saturation of the ground and any wind that we may experience as a consequence of the storm. Uh, along with any rain at all in a saturated ground could potentially down trees, which then takes us out with electricity. And if we are down electrically, um, that obviously takes us out of the game. So those are things that we're going to be paying attention to. Um, I think Wednesday at noon is sort of a big moment in the city of, of Falls Church because uh, that's the point in time where a lot of folks have said they're going to make some decisions, particularly around the fall festival. Uh, protect, um, potentially around the uh, 5K run for the Ed Foundation um, and the like. So um, likely we will try to make some decisions around the same time so that we're all together in the decision-making process. Um, any questions about sort of where we are with that? <coughs> we're on top of it. Um, I can assure you of that. And, uh, and I, I, as I have said before about winter snow calls, um, I tend to err on the side of caution and safety, and sometimes I make the right call and sometimes I don't. Um, but if I make it out of safety and an abundance of caution, I know that I've made the right decision and I can look myself in the face at night. So, um, so if we do make a decision to close school for flooding or for whatever purposes, please know that we make that out of, uh, out of safety more than anything. <clears throat> My kids advise to close school on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm sure that the hashtag close FCCPS will begin shortly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any questions for the superintendent? Right. No, you're joining everyone else across the state and making these calls because uh, in my world a lot of the Virginia universities are going to start closing on <coughs> Thursday if not the ones down in the Tidewater area <coughs> like uh, ADM yesterday mm -hmm. this morning they were supposed to be evacuated out so we're definitely uh, making that in the football game my nephews have played football down in Ottawa and they're <coughs> moving their varsity game to tomorrow night I think mm -hmm. as well so there is a lot of folks who are trying to to get things in before the weather completely cancels everything. So uh, not any of the calls that you have. Sometimes yeah. it's uh, good those to not have those. For <laughs> those of you who were around in 2002, uh, you might remember Isabel. Uh, Isabel came up through the Tidewater area and took us out for 
quite a while. And it was mostly because of downed trees and power lines. It wasn't that we got an, an inordinate amount of, 2003, an inordinate amount of rain. It was really more about uh, power. Thank you for the reminder. All right, next we'll move on to uh, board and student liaison comments. And I'll start down at the end with Ms. Gill. She has any comments? Oh, I do. I met with the boosters yesterday. So I have comments. Um, they, uh, they remain concerned about parking um, at the high school. Um, very, very concerned about parking in the new high school project. Um, they also want lighted fields on the new turf field, or lights on the new turf field. However, they are willing to do a fundraiser for them. And they'd like to know when is the drop dead for can they can they put those lights in later or does it have to go in at construction? Um, but they are very realistic about how hard it is to ask for money at this point in the project. Um, and they are going to move the tele to October 12th. That's the next home game after this week. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a smaller tailgate, oh. but um, they'll still have some barbecue. Thank you. I don't have Ms. Lytton. All right. Mr. Castillo. Uh, I missed out on the Parks and Rec Advisory Board meeting last week for back to school night at uh, George Mason for the last time last week. And that was a great event as, as always. It's so impressive to see the quality of the teaching and the dedication of the staff and the administrators and the teachers. So that's always a good, a good event. And I was, I missed the pledge because I was at the daycare advisory board just next door. A lot of enthusiasm for the playground equipment. It's, it's evidently, uh, it's like, I don't want to say Disney, <laughs> Disneyland on 66, <laughs> but there's a lot of enthusiasm and, and all, the, all the children are extremely excited about that. And uh, the, uh, we, we owe a lot to, to the daycare community for their contribution. And that's, that's it for me. Ms. Russell? So for the foundation, their big thing is the run for the schools. So everyone, please register whether or not it's on Sunday, but it will be held at some point. So if not Sunday, then a future. But they have fantastic prizes for the age groups, different things. So make sure, and even if you're not going to run, come walk, show up, cheer people on. It's a really fun, fantastic event. So. Mr. Anderson? Um, I guess I'd just like to take the opportunity to say I thought we had a really good turnout uh, at the community meeting last week, and, and I thought the structure of it worked really well. I walked around and listened into all of the conversations that were going on, and uh, there's a lot of good feedback contained in there, and I, I was struck by the, there's going to be a need to have some trade-offs, and making that statement at the end I think was very helpful. So. Uh, and then I wanted to say thanks to Ms. Minson for uh, patience conversations that we, uh, we had over the last week on the top policy, so thanks and all the hard work to put in. Mr. Reininger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, the, the two things I've attended, the community forum and the back to school night at George Mason, I think have already been covered. The one thing I would note is that I really, every year I get a real appreciation for the George Mason students as I have to leave one of the basement classrooms and <laughs> run all the way across for the subsequent <coughs> class. Because it's like, it can't be done in five minutes. I just. <laughs> Ms. White. I can assure you that it can be done in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I had to run from the bio classroom to uh, Dr. Fabesio's room at the very end of the basement. Um, for the first two weeks of school, I think really the only thing on students' minds right now is the fate of our homecoming on Saturday. Um, I think the weather has really thrown the SCA for a loop. And I mean, I'm sure that everyone will make decisions about rescheduling or having it if the thing somehow doesn't happen as scarily as it sounds. So I think uh, once all of that has passed, um, I'm going to start working with the SCA and go into their meetings regularly and hopefully have something to report to the board <coughs> on those. Um, but right now, pretty much all they're talking about is homecoming. It's, that's really early this year. Yes. So I um, just want to thank Peter for inviting us to convocation and for those who are able to attend it. Um, and those who haven't, if you have a chance to watch Peter's remarks, he just knocked it out of the park. So I thought it was a very um, well stated opening remarks and set an excellent tone for the year. So I really appreciate that and everything that you've done for our staff. So. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, I'm 
we'll piggyback on that. The convocation was great. I that's one of the events I really enjoy being able to go to. Um, seeing the teachers and administrators and staff all coming back. It's almost like them when students come back for the first day of school, of them trying to having conversations amongst themselves about what they did over the summer. So it's always a, a great time to do that and sharing with them that, you know, we truly appreciate all that they do and that on behalf of the board, just saying that, you know, we are here to support them and make sure that they have all the tools and resources to make sure that they are able to do their job. And I think that's, I just wanted to reiterate that to them and make sure that they know that, that we, we are, we're here to support them in all ways that we can. Uh, enjoyed my uh, time with the central office staff uh, on the first day of school. I, another great time to go into the building and seeing students excited to being back in the buildings. I felt kind of like the prize patrol of um, Publishers Clearinghouse of going into from building to building with with a prize in hand to give to the administrative offices as we walked in, but it was a great time to to see um, our folks back in, in their in the environment, and then particularly uh, Mount Daniel, as most folks know, Mount Daniel. For those of us who have been on the board for a little while, has been uh, the project that keeps on giving. <laughs> but I think it's to walk into that building, and it's so seamlessly between that new section and the. <coughs> That 1950 section, as um, as Dr. Noonan refers to it as, it's very seamless that you almost, when you walk from the new side into the old where the office was, you almost forget, oh, that's where the administrative offices were because of what they've done with that particular section and going in and taking a look at the updated bathrooms and those things and the new carpeting, and it, it gives it a whole new feel over there that... Once that section fully opens, the new section, I think we're going to have a, a great, great building. Um, and I can't wait till the dedication of that particular facility. And it, it gives us that opportunity to lessons learned from that particular project as we move on into the project with the new high school, which is a much larger capacity. And with that, uh, the Thursday night, e the evening event Thursday, I thought was pretty well attended with some different faces that you typically don't see within sharing their opinions about what their expectations are. And I agree with uh, with Mr. Anderson and Dr. Noonan that there are definitely going to be some trade-offs that will have to happen in, in the usual places that they seem to always um, butt heads. Uh, when I went home and was talking with, with Clifton about the meeting, I was like, yeah, there are two areas that kind of seem to always kind of come up on different ends of he's like and he very and I didn't say it he said athletics and the arts I was like you got it <laughs> so um which are both very important aspects of things that happen in our high school I think they both do tremendous jobs of of training and preparing our our young men and women um but definitely they're they're gonna have to to be some some trade-offs there for, within both areas to make sure that we get what we need for for both areas because you because they are important pieces of any high school. And I think uh, as we hear their feedback and and our teams that are in place and the administrators, Dr. Noonan, I think we'll, we'll make those tough decisions and trade-offs that, that, that we all will have, at the end of the day have to live with and, and have a great, great new high school at the end of the day. I think we are all looking forward to that. But I do enjoy seeing the enthusiasm within our community about this brand new project and definitely brought up some different topics and things that some of us may not have thought about, particularly classroom usage in the building for the community because of of where we've talked about kind of that public space area, but they're like, well, what if someone needs to have a classroom for a meeting? And we're like, oh, we were talking about closing that section of the building off. So it's thinking about some rooms that we could have, still closing off the majority of that space, but maybe having a few rooms that are, are open for usage for the community. But I think we are off to a great start and can't wait till the day we are shovels in ground, throwing that dirt and getting, getting the project started. Right. Any other comments from anyone? Uh, just one, one last uh, yes. comment, just so you all know, I did have an opportunity this morning to meet with uh, Danny Schlitt and the and his team from the Rex and Park Department, um, and uh, wanted to make sure that 
he knew that his board was welcome to come to all of the um, community events as well. So I just wanted to publicly state that, you know, we hope that the Parks and Rec folks will come. I know there's been a couple of people that have come, um, but I, since they're so interested in the building use, it would be nice if they, if they would come, in, maybe in mass. And Leslie is typically there on a regular basis to make sure that that particular voice is heard from them about the community use of the, of the facility. I know Les Leslie Rye has yep. been coming, and I think uh, Charlie O'Hara came to one Charlie of them. Charlie has been there as, as well. well, yes. Alrighty. Yes. I, I think that's a great idea because I think if they if they engaged in those, I, I think their many of their concerns would would be addressed. So. I, I will also encourage them, and I have been doing that, so. All right. And we have two sets of minutes for approval. Um, has asked unanimous consent for the approval of the minutes for June 5th, 2017, and for approval of the minutes of August 14th, 2018. Right. Without a without objection so can you, can you, can you, any comment if you weren't there do you yes. just keep your mouth shut during i checked with elizabeth ewing and she said it is fine if you were not at, at, in attendance because really boards change and so minutes that would be before you were even ever on the board, you may have to be able to um, vote on those. So you do not have to abstain. Because you may not have enough people. If you had a, four people leave the board to then approve minutes. Thank you very much. And I don't know if there's any material for review, but if not, uh, did, did somebody move to adopt the minutes? And then if there's any materials for the board to review, uh, and with that, we stand adjourned. Thank you all very much. <laughs>